Section 1 of President Lincoln's Attitude Toward Slavery and Emancipation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. President Lincoln's Attitude Toward Slavery and Emancipation by Henry Watson Wilbur. Section 1. Forward. It is nearly half a century since the untimely death of President Lincoln, and during all these years he has steadily grown in popular favor. Because of his having come from the ranks of the common people, plus the crown of martyrdom forced upon him, he probably appeals to the general imagination more than any other man in our history. In a nationwide referendum for the selection of the typical American, it is likely Lincoln would receive a large majority. But any attempt to make him out a sort of superman would be unjust to his character. It is easy to imagine with what fine scorn and apt stories he would repel any attempt to place him on a pedestal and Hellenize him as a demigod. It is therefore with an intensely human Lincoln that we wish to deal. The original purpose in making this book was simply to consider the evolution of Lincoln's mind in approaching the Emancipation Proclamation, with such personal estimates of his contemporaries as would show the manner and method of the man as he dealt with the great problem, the solution of which was committed to him. The study of the case, however, grew in interest as we proceeded. Since the work was begun, conditions have developed in our country, which seem to demand that the case be brought down to date, rather than stop with the close of the Civil War and the death of Lincoln. If the period before emancipation, and the events which belong to it, were important in an effort to understand the issue which culminated with the rebellion, then what has been going on since that time must be considered to make the story complete. All that the act of emancipation could possibly do, no matter how accomplished, was to simplify the problem, for it surely did not solve it. If it shall appear, as we proceed, that the writer has a firm conviction that the fruits of our unfortunate civil war should be preserved in fortifying, extending, and perpetuating the benefits and blessings of free government, he hopes that the case may be presented without bitterness. While the personal estimates of Lincoln made by his contemporaries were slightly conflicting at certain points, it should be said that the general character of this first-hand evidence is singularly united touching the temper and motive of his conduct. Moral sincerity and a fixed purpose to so save and fortify free government that it should not perish from the earth was undoubtedly the center of his purpose. For the sake of this great undertaking, he was willing to hold sentiment in abeyance, and heavily tax the sympathy and endurance of a most tender spirit. Hence we shall endeavor to so present the varied estimates of the men of his time, that a correct conclusion regarding the real Lincoln may be reached. If, when the evidence is all in, it shall appear that touching all the questions involved, from the freedom of the slaves to the reconstruction of the states in rebellion, Lincoln was really ahead rather than behind the major public sentiment of his time, his real greatness will be more plainly apparent. Idealist, and almost prophet and poet, he knew how to meet the real world on its own ground, and how much of his idealism could be worked in the life of men, and in a scheme of national progress which should be human enough to belong to this world, and virile enough to stand on its feet. In the midst of all his experiences, his deeply religious nature will be constantly seen in command of even his wit and his wisdom, as he went about the severe task which confronted him. Lincoln understood the spiritual values, and because of that understanding, he developed into a constructive statesman of the first rank. With the hope that the facts and opinions herein set forth may result in making President Lincoln better understood, the valuable work he did for his country in the hour of its greatest peril more keenly appreciated, 
and the lesson of his life an increasing inspiration to his countrymen, we send this volume on its way. Slavery in the Colonies No adequate understanding of the institution of slavery in its relation to the general government, and especially as it involved the country in a civil war, in whose fiery furnace the institution died, is possible without some knowledge of its growth and the ways and means by which it secured constitutional recognition. There seems to be little doubt that if the majority of the fathers and founders of the Republic could have formed a more perfect union, and framed a constitution entirely after their own hearts, provision would have been made for the gradual removal of slavery from our country. In fact, the opinion was rather general in the period immediately following the Revolution, that in the main, slavery was not economically profitable, while it was held to be morally inconsistent with the genius of republican institutions. It was a minority of the fathers who forced the fatal compromise which perpetuated the institution, which was to prove a millstone about the nation's neck. At the time of the adoption of the Constitution, slavery existed and was a legalized institution in every state in the Union, Massachusetts excepted. In the census of 1790 there were less than 4,000 slaves in New England, two-thirds of the number being in Connecticut. The states of New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania contained 36,484 human chattels, Pennsylvania having only 3,737. Slavery ceased in all these states long before the Civil War. At the time indicated, the slaves in Delaware and Maryland numbered 111,923, 103,036 of this number being held in servitude in the latter state. The following represents the number of slaves in the four states of the original thirteen which sided with the Confederacy in the Civil War. Virginia, 293,427. North Carolina, 100,372. South Carolina, 107,094. Georgia, 29,264. Total, 520,357. As the number of slaves in the entire country in 1790 was reported as 657,527, it will be seen that about 80% of the slaves were in the four states which in 1861 joined hands with the Southern Confederacy. The Ninth Continental Congress, in session in Annapolis, considered a plan for the government of, quote, the territory ceded already, or to be ceded, by the individual states to the United States, end quote. Thomas Jefferson introduced what has passed into history as the Ordinance of 1784. The Ordinance, among other things, provided, quote, that after the year 1800 of the Christian era, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the said states. End quote. This ordinance failed of adoption because an affirmative vote of a majority of the states was not recorded. Had New Jersey been fully represented and voted as New York and Pennsylvania did, the ordinance would have been carried. South Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland voted against the ordinance, and the vote of North Carolina was divided. Thus early did the fathers attempt to provide for the non-extension of slave territory. In 1787, the last Continental Congress assembled in New York, and at the same time the convention which had been called to frame a constitution for all of the states was deliberating in Philadelphia. This Congress adopted, by practically unanimous vote, the Ordinance of 1787. Its sixth article contained the non-extension of slavery clause of the defeated ordinance considered three years before. The Constitutional Convention met behind closed doors, and no official record of its detailed deliberations exists. Still, reliable evidence indicates that early in its sessions, South Carolina and Georgia appeared to make demands in behalf of some recognition of slavery. Such recognition appeared in three places, 
and in as many ways in our fundamental law. It is suggestive, however, that neither the words slave or slavery appear in the immortal document. Nothing more surely illustrates the fact that even in 1787 the question was not a pleasant one to consider. The minds of the fathers seem to have been set at ease by the compromises which made the ratification of the Constitution by the requisite number of states possible. From the political standpoint, the most valuable concession to slavery in the Constitution was the provision which made the slave population a basis of representation in Congress, in the following terms, quote, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons, end quote three-fifths of all other persons covered the slaves and gave an added numerical strength to the slave states in the popular branch of congress what was section nine of article one in the original draft of the constitution contained a veiled endorsement of the slave trade in the following language quote, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the congress prior to the year one thousand eight hundred and eight but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation not exceeding ten dollars for each person End quote. the third concession to south carolina and georgia appeared in section three of article four quote, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof escaping into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due End quote. this is the part of the constitution called the slave catching provision which met the severe condemnation of the abolitionists under the constitution in 1789, immediately following the adoption of the Constitution, North Carolina proposed to cede her outlying territory, which later became the state of Tennessee, to the Federal Union. Before the transfer of this territory, Congress was required to accept the following condition, quote, provided always that no regulation made or to be made by Congress shall tend to emancipate slaves, end quote three years later georgia proceeded to make over to the general government territory belonging to her out of which the states of alabama and mississippi were eventually formed it was stipulated that the specified territory should be organized into states according to the provisions of the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven with the proviso quote, the article only accepted which forbids slavery end quote. Congress acceded to this demand, and two new slave states were thus carved out of territory which the Ordinance of 1787 dedicated to freedom. Following these comparatively easy victories, a campaign was begun to divide and organize Indiana Territory, now comprising the states of Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, on the basis of tolerated slavery, but the attempt failed and slavery aggression was suspended until the purchase of louisiana from france when an added impulse was furnished to the slave interest but something happened more important than the purchase of territory or the suspension of ordinances guaranteeing freedom namely the invention of the cotton gin by eli whitney that made cotton growing a most profitable type of agriculture and gave to slavery its immense mercenary footing from this time on the struggle between the forces of freedom and slavery became more and more intense the moral conscience touching the peculiar institution rapidly deteriorated as the seeming profit in slave labor increased churches which hoped and resolved against slavery lapsed into silence as the jingling of the dollar healed the hurt 
which conscience felt horace greeley referring to resolutions against the institution adopted by a southern church convention sagely remarked that quote, no similar declaration has been made by any church south of the mason and dixon line since field hands rose to one thousand dollars each and black infants at birth were accounted worth one hundred dollars the territory of missouri comprising all the purchase from france except the state of louisiana came up for consideration when part of the territory knocked for admission into the union as a state in eighteen eighteen over the petition the storm raged furiously as it progressed many surprises developed thomas jefferson in spite of the fact that he was the author of the non-extension ordinance of seventeen eighty four gave the full weight of his influence to slavery extension as did ex-president madison the outcome of the controversy was the missouri compromise which is here given Quote, and be it further enacted that in all that territory ceded by france to the united states under the name of louisiana which lies north of thirty six degrees thirty minutes north latitude excepting only such part thereof as is included within the limits of the state contemplated by this act slavery and involuntary servitude otherwise than in the punishment of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall be and is hereby for ever prohibited End quote. missouri was thus admitted as a slave state in eighteen twenty with the territory to the south of thirty six degrees north latitude open to the peculiar institution and all north of that line ordained to freedom in eighteen forty five president polk suggested that a treaty of peace might be negotiated with mexico provided it carried with it an appropriation for securing land beyond the existing national boundary the real object was of course more territory and larger opportunity for the expansion of slavery while this effort was pending david wilmot a member of the house of representatives of pennsylvania and at that time a democrat in politics introduced the proviso which made his name historic this paragraph inserted in the bill was as follows quote, provided that as an express and fundamental condition to the acquisition of any territory from the republic of mexico by the united states by virtue of any treaty that may be negotiated between them and to the use by the executive of the monies herein appropriated neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any part of said territory except for crime whereof the party shall first be duly convicted End quote. the wilmot proviso contained the gist of the whole attempt to prevent the extension of slave territory while it passed the house it failed in the senate and the bill which carried it never became a law probably no like number of words shorn of all legal or applied value ever occupied a place of such importance as this proviso did in the history of american legislation the compromises of eighteen fifty introduced in the senate by henry clay revived the whole question of slavery and strengthened that institution especially by repealing all provision for restricting slave territory by enacting the fugitive slave law and pledging abstinence of the abolition of slavery in certain sections of the country these compromises ugly as they were in many respects from the anti-slavery standpoint were pretty generally accepted by public opinion north and south a false sense of security settled over the country in the opinion that these compromises settled the slavery question while as a matter of fact they only intensified the irrepressible conflict nothing served more to intensify the disturbing issue of slavery than the kansas nebraska bill this was a measure for organizing the region westward of missouri and iowa into two territories to be known as kansas and nebraska stephen a douglas then senator from illinois at this point devised a plan for dealing with slavery in new territories which became popularly known as squatter sovereignty 
in other words the plan provided that all matters pertaining to slavery in the territories and in the new states to be formed therefrom are to be left to the decision of the people residing therein through their appropriate representatives it was generally admitted that the kansas nebraska bill repealed the missouri compromise and all the free territory in the country was handed over to the tender mercies of such settlers as might be induced to enter a state and stay long enough to vote out of this plan grew the bloody struggles in kansas the details of which do not belong in this story the kansas nebraska bill undoubtedly furnished the final logical reason for the organization of the national republican party with a non-extension of slave territory as its dominant issue as the party's first successful candidate for president from eighteen sixty until the end abraham lincoln became the moral and political storm center of the slavery controversy end of section one section two of president lincoln's attitude toward slavery and emancipation by henry watson wilbur this librivox recording is in the public domain invoking the letter of the law the union had barely become an established fact when the slave power proceeded to make the supposed constitutional guarantees given to slavery effective by law in seventeen ninety three a bill was passed by congress to facilitate the capture of fugitive slaves this law contained four provisions it guaranteed the right to arrest the fugitive when found this in many cases amounted to arrest on suspicion and on the unsupported assertion of the alleged owner the law also conferred the right to take the fugitive before a magistrate when he was arrested it made it the duty of the magistrate to examine the case and commit the alleged slave to the custody of the master the right of the master to remove the fugitive from the jurisdiction wherein he was found was also upheld it was not an uncommon thing for runaway slaves to be arrested under the provisions of this act of congress with the growth of the abolition movement attempted escapes became more frequent and the branches of the underground railroad made successful escape increasingly possible the provisions of the fugitive slave laws did not stop the attempt of slaves to secure their freedom and there was an increasing revulsion in the north against every man being constituted a possible slave hunter a good deal of partial history has been written about the non-enforcement of the statute of seventeen ninety three and the so-called compromise act of eighteen fifty this non-enforcement has been given as a cause of the civil war by a distinguished historian and publicist Quote, it seemed evident to the southern men too that the north would not pause or hesitate because of constitutional guarantees for twenty years northern states had been busy passing personal liberty laws intended to bar the operation of the federal statutes concerning fugitive slaves and to secure for all alleged fugitives legal privileges which the federal statutes withheld more than a score of states had passed laws with this object and such acts were as plainly attempts to nullify the constitutional action of congress as if they had spoken the language of the south carolina ordinance of eighteen thirty two this statement sounds plausible and might really be so if there was no difference between a tax for the support of the general government and a demand for the return of men and women to an unnatural bondage but the facts of the case are that the slave catchers frequently apprehended persons upon whom no valid claim under the law rested several states had provided that the residence of a slave within their borders for a specified time with the knowledge of his master made him a free man persons of this sort were liable to be apprehended and dragged back into slavery the above statement by president wilson undoubtedly represents the extreme southern view regarding what was called northern nullification representing a supposed provoking aggressiveness on the part of the free states but the provocation was not one-sided in this particular let us summon another southern-born man as a witness as follows Quote, the southern leaders in washington forced gag rules through congress to keep out abolitionist petitions 
they suborned the postal service to their ends and got abolitionist literature debarred from the mails they invaded the north and dragged slaves back to their plantations they browbeat liberty men in congress they hanged john brown whenever they failed to crush out abolitionism it was because there was in the nature of things no way to reach it not because northern public men kept them from having their will upon it End quote. this is a mild and truthful statement of what happened during this period such as the brutal attack upon charles sumner in the senate chamber by representative preston s brooks of south carolina in eighteen fifty six and the border ruffian outrages in kansas both sides were intense and both did things not wise and generally not gentle the south was much more militant than the north and more used to bloodletting so that assaults upon the person like the murder of elijah p lovejoy footnote a clergyman a native of the state of maine who went to st louis and edited a religious newspaper in which he opposed the barbarisms of slavery to escape persecution he moved his paper to alton illinois where he was most viciously treated his plant was destroyed and a new press was secured in defending his property against a pro-slavery mob he was shot and killed november seventh eighteen thirty seven End footnote. by a pro-slavery mob at alton illinois was pretty universally monopolized by the advocates and representatives of the slave power for a complete understanding of the issue raised in this chapter it is worth while to find out just what the fugitive slave law and the so-called personal liberty laws were the fugitive slave law of eighteen fifty was surely a sample of misfit legislation in a republic while the constitution of our country provided for trial by jury in all suits at common law when the value in controversy exceeded twenty dollars an issue involving the freedom of men women and children was committed to a single united states commissioner endowed with absolute and arbitrary power and from whose decision there could be no appeal heavy penalties were imposed on american free men who might be instrumental in rescuing or concealing a runaway slave or directly or indirectly aiding his escape the penalty for such an exhibition of humanity was a fine not exceeding one thousand dollars and imprisonment not exceeding six months in addition civil damages might be collected by the injured slaveholder to the amount of one thousand dollars for each slave thus assisted to escape the claimant might arrest a fugitive and take him before a magistrate without process in hearing the case the testimony of the alleged slave was not admitted the most interested party being ignored a bribe of five dollars in the open palm was offered to each commissioner if he would only return the alleged fugitive to slavery for this law provided a fee of five dollars to the magistrate if he pronounced the defendant a free man while he received ten dollars if he was adjudged a slave it may be noted that when the matter of a few runaway slaves was involved the southern dogma of state rights was thrown out of the window and the national government was urged to enter a state and arbitrarily override its sovereignty the only possible warrant for considering this sample monstrosity in legislation the constitutional action of congress is the dred scott decision rendered by the supreme court in eighteen fifty seven this decision affirmed that neither a negro slave nor the descendant of such slave could be a citizen of the united states and therefore such person had no right of action in a federal court in the expressive language of the time the decision held that a colored man had no rights which a white man was bound to respect not even the right to the possession and protection of his own body if any white man disputed his claim that the fugitive slave law was considered constitutional in the fifties and was possibly accepted by a majority of the american citizens may be true but that any man during the past forty years could refer to its provisions with approval only shows how slow has been the progress of our humane perceptions the so-called personal liberty laws were purely local statutes and were mainly for local protection they began to appear in the forties and were partly called into being by a supreme court decision handed down in eighteen forty two which was particularly favorable to slave catchers and their arbitrary rights laws of this sort were amended and strengthened after the passage of the fugitive slave law in eighteen fifty 
fourteen northern states had laws which the sensitive slave power of the south claimed militated against slaveholders rights and sought their economic ruin in the main the personal liberty laws prohibited the use of the local legal machinery for the capture of fugitive slaves for instance they forbid the employment of the local jails or the local officials in the slave hunting business and provided protection for negroes hunted by kidnappers such a conservative newspaper as the national intelligencer of washington a paper always favorable to slavery said that the provisions of these laws were not unconstitutional the late vice president henry wilson in referring to laws of this character passed in massachusetts said that they were quote, not designed to defeat her constitutional obligations or to interfere with the execution of even the fugitive slave act but simply to protect her own inhabitants End quote. the importance of these laws has been greatly exaggerated as has the damage done to slavery on account of the venturesome slaves who did not fancy the paternal and patriarchal system under which they were held in bondage and who either attempted to run away or succeeded in doing so in the year eighteen sixty only twenty slaves escaped from south carolina and one hundred nineteen ran away from their masters in kentucky during the same period the non-enforcement of the fugitive slave laws by the north because of the slight uncertainty it threw upon slave property was no cause for trying to dissolve the union it was a false cry of stop thief to deceive the unwary and stimulate sympathy for secession lincoln's early convictions it is never easy to locate actual beginnings of any sort and it is doubly difficult to say just when real convictions began to shape themselves in the minds of even concerned and serious men regarding lincoln's mind on the slavery question the above statement is particularly applicable on this point his biographers say quote, there have been several ingenious attempts to show the origin and occasion of mr lincoln's anti-slavery convictions they seem to us an idle waste of labor these sentiments came with the first awakening of his mind and conscience and were roused into active life and energy by the sight of fellow creatures in chains on an ohio river steamboat and on the wharf at new orleans End quote. in spite of this exhortation it may be worth while to trace some of the steps by which lincoln was progressively led to take a stand against a domestic institution apparently so thoroughly safeguarded as to be immovable it would seem that his mind was first stirred on the slavery question by close observation of the institution in action lincoln and his friend john hanks went on a commercial expedition by flatboat to new orleans in eighteen thirty six the statement by hanks of the influence of this experience on his companion is quoted by mr lincoln's biographers with approval and may be considered authentic we are told that in new orleans they saw for the first time quote, negroes chained maltreated whipped and scourged lincoln saw it his heart bled said nothing was silent looked bad was thoughtful and abstracted i can say knowing it that it was on this trip that he formed his opinion of slavery it ran its iron into him then and there may eighteen thirty one i have heard him say so often and often End quote. lincoln was then twenty-seven years old three years later he was elected a member of the illinois legislature to which body he was subsequently twice re-elected it was during his second legislative term that he had occasion to protest against too much sympathy with slavery on the part of his colleagues passing resolutions in support of the institution was a popular pastime in the law-making bodies of many states illinois proceeded to join the legislative chorus in a series of resolutions against abolition societies and in reiteration of the extra constitutional privileges enjoyed by slave holders lincoln drew up a protest against the action of the majority his friend dan stone about to quit active politics for the bench signed the document with its author but no other office holder in illinois developed a like courage in this protest lincoln said that he quote, believed the institution of slavery was founded both on injustice and bad policy end quote. such an utterance was not popular 
with the public opinion of his constituents in Sagamon County in 1836. There was apparently no reason for this deliverance against slavery, but the honest conviction of the man who made it. That Lincoln was re-elected to the legislature after this episode proves that he was always personally more popular than the cause he represented as a candidate. The period from the close of his legislative career in Illinois to the year 1846 seems to have been politically unproductive, although it was undoubtedly a time of preparation. In the latter year Lincoln was elected a representative to Congress, defeating his Democratic opponent, Peter Cartwright, the celebrated Methodist preacher. Lincoln was the only Whig representative from Illinois in the 30th Congress. He allied himself with the opponents of the Mexican War, and thus invited the hostility of the slave power, then insinuatingly, when not insultingly, maintaining a dominating influence in the national law-making body. Lincoln had scarcely got his bearings in the House when an attempt was made to give the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793 greater efficiency and certainty in the District of Columbia. Various resolutions pro and con were submitted, and finally Mr. Lincoln introduced an amendment to the pending measure. One of its provisions was compensated emancipation in the district, subject to a referendum in which all white male citizens of voting age were to decide the question. The sixth section of Mr. Lincoln's measure provided more effective machinery for the capture and rendition of fugitive slaves apprehended in the District of Columbia. Having this measure in mind, when Lincoln was nominated for president in 1860, Wendell Phillips vehemently denounced the candidate as, quote, the slave hound of Illinois, end quote. It should be said in explanation, if not in extenuation of Lincoln's act, that at no time did he doubt that the slaveholder was entitled to the protection of the government for his slave property, where the institution was already established. About 1851, Lincoln replied to a letter received from his friend, Joshua Speed. Reading between the lines of this correspondence, the conclusion is warranted that Speed had charged his friend with waning interest in the cause. If there was any reason for this inference, it would simply indicate that the great emancipator had not entirely escaped the moral sleeping sickness touching the slavery question, which afflicted the whole country following the compromise measures of 1850. Lincoln's letter is a most important document as a self-revelation of the movement of his mind, and the impelling motive which formed the basis of his interest in the cause of freedom. Mr. Lincoln thus wrote, quote, in 1841, you and I had a tedious, low-water trip on a steamboat from Louisville to St. Louis. You may remember, as I well do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were on board ten or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continual torment to me, and I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio or any other slave border. It is not fair for you to assume that I have no interest in a thing which has, and continually exercises, the power of making me miserable." End quote. This personal admission may well introduce us to that strenuous time in the later fifties when Lincoln really put on the harness of service and sacrifice for freedom, only to be put off when death overtook him. End of section 2section three of president lincoln's attitude toward slavery and emancipation by henry watson wilbur this librivox recording is in the public domain lincoln and the douglas debates the rising tide in lincoln's affairs which led on to political fortune appeared in the series of debates with stephen a douglas in 1858 the prize in the contest being the position of United States Senator from Illinois. Lincoln lost the honor, although he had more votes in the state than his opponent. The trouble was gerrymandered legislative districts, which gave the Democrats more votes in the legislature than the Republicans. Lincoln intimated to his friends during the contest that he was gunning for bigger game than the senatorship, alluring as that was. Whether or not he had the presidency in mind, he won it very largely because of these debates and their aftermath of discussion, which took him to Ohio, New York, 
and New England. During these debates, Lincoln's personal political philosophy was presented with commanding force, and in attractive form. In addition, he expounded the creed of the new Republican Party with a vigor and logic which was not equaled by any of the advocates of the new cause. There were those who willingly admitted Lincoln's ability to convince the rough and ready Western mind, who doubted that he could score a like success when dealing with a supposedly keener Eastern intellect. But the doubters and the critics were silenced when in the Cooper Union speech in New York City, and the later one at New Haven, under the droppings of Yale University, captains of industry and finance in Gotham, and the cultured college men in New England alike surrendered to the genius of the uncouth rail-splitter from the West. Mr. Lincoln was unanimously chosen the Republican candidate for senator from Illinois, at a convention which met in Springfield June 26, 1857. He addressed this convention in the most carefully prepared speech he had ever delivered, in which he dealt with the dominant and collateral issues of the campaign. The following extract is probably the best known of any utterance by Lincoln, only excepting the Gettysburg speech. Quote, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided it will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it, and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. End quote. Lincoln believed every word he uttered, every point in this extract is as clear as language can make it the country must become either all slave or all free he was willing to stake his all on such practical conduct as would ultimately make it all free that remained his position to the end even though he made saving the union more important than securing freedom he believed that with the union saved ultimate freedom for a united country was possible on the other hand, with a confederacy triumphant and a severed union as a result, slavery would sit enthroned in the South, backed by an oligarchy more potent to preserve the institution than the Southern leaders had been in the old Union. In 1858, William H. Seward made his famous speech in Rochester, New York, in which he referred to slavery as the irrepressible conflict. He also made a statement very much like Lincoln's quoted above. Under pressure he sought to qualify and tone down his utterance, a thing which Lincoln refused to do. When he took a stand or made a statement, it was after careful deliberation, in which he went over all of the ground. Having thus taken a position, he maintained it with consistency and constancy. In one of the debates with Douglas, Mr. Lincoln criticized his antagonist because of an implied if not confessed, indifference regarding slavery itself, in which he said, quote, He may say he doesn't care whether an indifferent thing is voted up or down, but he must logically have a choice between a right thing and a wrong thing. He contends that whatever community wants slaves has a right to have them, so they have if it is not a wrong. But if it is a wrong, he cannot say people have a right to do wrong. He says that, upon the score of equality, slaves should be allowed to go into a new territory like other property. This is strictly logical, if there is no difference between it and other property. If it 
and other property are equal, his argument is entirely logical. But if you insist that one is wrong and the other right, there is no use to institute a comparison between right and wrong. You may turn over everything in the democratic policy, from beginning to end, whether in the shape it takes on the statute book, in the shape it takes in the Dred Scott decision, in the shape it takes in conversation, or in the shape it takes in short maxim-like arguments. It everywhere carefully excludes the idea that there is anything wrong in it. That is the real issue. That is the issue that will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. It is the eternal struggle between these two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world. They are the two principles that have stood face to face from the beginning of time and will ever continue to struggle. The one is the common right of humanity, and the other the divine right of kings. It is the same principle in whatever shape it develops itself. It is the same spirit that says, You work and toil and earn bread, and I'll eat. No matter in what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another race, it is the same tyrannical principle. End quote. It was common before the war for pro-slavery sympathizers and agitators to talk about the opponents of slavery marrying Negroes, and they considered that personal insult a knock-down argument against emancipation. Mr. Lincoln thus paid his respects to an assault of this kind. Quote, now I protest against the counterfeit logic which concludes that because I do not want a black woman for a slave, I must necessarily want her for a wife. I need not have her for either. I can just leave her alone. In some respects, she certainly is not my equal, but in her natural right to eat the bread she earns with her own hands, without asking leave of any one else, she is my equal, and the equal of all others. End quote. In these statements, Mr. Lincoln reiterates his constant position about natural rights. A good many men and women today have not reached his position, whenever the rights of a so-called inferior race are involved. And yet, there can be no progress towards a reasonable economic and political freedom unless the Lincoln standard is maintained. In the debate at Freeport, Illinois, August 2, 1858, Mr. Lincoln answered certain questions that had been asked him by Douglas, one related to his position regarding the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, and the other as to the right and power of Congress to pass and enforce a fugitive slave law. Touching the first question, he said, quote, I believe that Congress possesses the constitutional power to abolish it. Yet as a member of Congress, I should not, with my present views, be in favor of endeavoring to abolish slavery in the District of Columbia, unless it would be upon these conditions. First, that the abolition should be gradual. Second, that it should be on a vote of a majority of the qualified voters of the district. And third, that compensation should be made to unwilling owners. With these three conditions, I confess that I would be exceedingly glad to see Congress abolish slavery in the District of Columbia and, in the language of Henry Clay, sweep from our capital that foul blot upon our nation. End quote. Referring to the right of Congress to assist the slaveholder in catching his runaway human property, Mr. Lincoln thus expressed himself, quote, Under the Constitution of the United States, the people of the South are entitled to a Congressional Fugitive Slave Law, it should have been framed so as to be free from some of the objections that pertain to it, without lessening its efficiency. End quote. It would seem that we have quoted enough of the words of Lincoln to definitely show his position on the slavery question. He believed in and desired freedom for all men. But he was equally certain that slavery was a constitutional institution and while it remained so slaveholders had rights of protection which the government was bound to accord he was not an abolitionist 
and beyond the clear conviction that the extension of slavery could be prevented and prohibited in the territories in complete accord with the supreme law of the land he had no plan for its abolition other than by and with the consent of the slaveholders when he assumed the office of president of the united states that his mind progressed surely if slowly in the direction of freedom as the events of the war period helped to rapidly make history will be amply shown by the evidence his moral and mental attitude regarding the great iniquity reached its climax in the emancipation proclamation and its spiritual interpretation in the last inaugural anti-slavery sentiment before the war in an attempt to make plain the task confronting president lincoln in connection with emancipation even as a war measure it is necessary to ask and answer the following question what was the real anti-slavery strength of the country in eighteen sixty in the main the present generation is inclined to fancy that the free states were rather solidly anti-slavery before the civil war but such was not the case measuring public sentiment numerically is always a difficult task it can never be done accurately when great questions ethical or otherwise become political issues upon which the electorate can pass judgment at the ballot box there is a reasonably satisfactory chance to measure sentiment if not conviction on that particular subject surely slavery was such an issue in eighteen sixty but even so the immediate abolition of slavery was not an issue represented by any political party or advocated by any presidential candidate four candidates for president appealed to the electorate in 1860 all of them but lincoln held an attitude of approval of the peculiar institution or were indifferent either as to its existence or its extension as the candidate of the republican party mr lincoln was unconditionally opposed to the extension of slavery into any new territory the platform repudiated the southern dogma that quote, the constitution of its own force carries slavery into any or all of the territories of the united states End quote. this document also affirmed quote, that the normal condition of all the territory of the united states is that of freedom End quote. the platform contained no hint or desire however to interfere with slavery in the states where it was already an established institution mr lincoln's three opponents for the office of president were stephen a douglas of illinois john c breckinridge of kentucky and john bell of tennessee the platform on which mr douglas stood as the regular democratic candidate was entirely pro-slavery sustaining the fugitive slave law and the right of slaveholders to settle with their property in any territory when organized into a state the question of slavery or freedom was to be determined by the people of the new state mr breckinridge was nominated by a convention which bolted from the regular democratic gathering he represented the ultra southern view regarding slavery and the constitution mr bell was nominated by the constitutional union party which was supposed to be the residuary legatee of the american or know nothing party this party declared quote, that it is both the part of patriotism and of duty to recognize no political principle other than the constitution of the country the union of the states and the enforcement of the laws End quote. this brief review will show that slavery was an issue in the election only as to its extension and increase and not as its immediate or even remote abolition when the ballots were counted in november they showed a much divided electorate the candidates having received the following vote lincoln one million eight hundred fifty seven thousand six hundred ten douglas one million two hundred ninety one thousand five hundred seventy four breckinridge eight hundred fifty thousand eighty two bell six hundred forty six thousand one hundred twenty four while mr lincoln representing the non-extension of slavery had a majority of the electors he polled nine hundred thirty thousand one hundred seventy fewer votes than his opponents combined 
the successful candidate received but twenty six thousand four hundred thirty votes in the slave states and these were cast in the five states of delaware maryland virginia kentucky and missouri breckinridge the southern and slavery candidate received two hundred seventy nine thousand two hundred eleven votes in the free states one hundred thousand of which were cast in pennsylvania where breckinridge led douglas by more than twenty thousand the combined vote of douglas breckinridge and bell in the free states was one million five hundred fifty seven thousand four hundred eleven it will thus be seen that in the free states there was a majority of only two hundred seventy three thousand six hundred sixty nine in favor of the non-extension of slave territory to the extent of the electors being willing to vote their convictions in the ballot box of those who voted for lincoln a certain number were undoubtedly in favor of abolishing slavery throughout the national domain the remnant of the old liberty and free soil parties were undoubtedly in favor of such abolition as were considerable numbers of anti-slavery men who professed no partisan attachment among the bell supporters in new england of whom there were about ten thousand there may have been some real anti-slavery men and this may be true of the bell men in new york new jersey and pennsylvania but the number was unknown and negligible there may have been some opponents of slavery in the douglas contingency but not enough to make a very substantial showing assuming that an emancipation proclamation could have been issued in eighteen sixty one as a war measure or on any other ground with a sustaining public opinion in the loyal states behind it has little if any warrant in the facts of history end of section three section four of president lincoln's attitude toward slavery and emancipation by henry watson wilbur this librivox recording is in the public domain the period of attempted conciliation public opinion in the north underwent strange freaks of wavering after the election of eighteen sixty it was everywhere manifested in a truculent timidity willing to swallow principles and practically surrender the victory of the election to placate the threat of secession in the south where a reckless haste characterized the leadership manifestly the president-elect could hope for neither sympathy nor support from those who were busy hatching the rebellion probably no man ever assumed the duties of the presidency with a more uncertain backing and a more chaotic public opinion from those who supported him than did mr lincoln the north was willing to do anything to placate the wrath of the erring brethren and keep them in a union they were conspiring to wreck free speech was denied in northern cities and every discouragement from threatened mob interference to conservative exhortation was employed to prevent a discussion of the slavery question and in philadelphia george william curtis was prevented giving a popular lecture in no way related to the dangerous topic simply because of his known anti-slavery sympathies some of the free states repealed their personal liberty laws manufacturing all sorts of soothing syrup for the disturbed body politic was the principal business north of the mason dixon line in the winter of eighteen sixty one but the resolutions and compromises introduced and passed through the labors of members of the republican party in congress constitute the most astonishing sample of faint-heartedness and subservient surrender of professed conviction in the history of our country when congress assembled the first monday in december eighteen sixty the rush to be first in the effort to placate the south began henry winter davis who later found mr lincoln too easy in possible efforts at reconstruction wanted congress to urge the states to speedily get rid of their laws favorable to runaway slaves his recommendation contained a provision which now sounds like a joke it was to the effect that the fugitive slave law should be amended so as to secure trial by jury to the fugitive slave not in the north where he might be captured but in the slave state the home of his master it was reserved to charles francis adams of massachusetts 
to propose the heaviest overture to the slaveholding interest he suggested that the constitution of the united states be amended so that no future amendment to that instrument quote, having for its object any interference with slavery shall originate with any state that does not recognize that relation within its own limits or shall be valid without the consent of every one of the states comprising the union End quote. this was maintaining the union by exacting uniformity and was giving any one state the power to thwart the wishes of all of the rest both houses of congress appointed large committees to patch up a plan of conciliation the senate committee could not agree but the house committee of thirty-three was more united and reported among other things six amendments to the constitution all favorable to slavery and practically guaranteeing its perpetuation the sixth amendment made it impossible for the people or the states ever to amend or repeal the pro-slavery amendments suggested the climax was reached however with the adoption of the following amendment to the constitution Quote, no amendment shall be made to the constitution which will authorize or give to congress the power to abolish or interfere with any state with the domestic institutions thereof including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state End quote. this proposed amendment passed the house by a vote of one thirty three to sixty five and in the senate the vote was twenty four to twelve exactly the necessary two-thirds the entire opposition in the house came from republicans but it received the support of a good many members of president lincoln's party and could not have passed without republican votes this joint resolution was listed as the thirteenth amendment to the constitution it was voted on and passed by the legislature of maryland and ohio but failed in new england while these efforts at compromise and conciliation were going on in congress southern men some of them members of either the house or senate were busy conspiring to set up the confederacy not a little of this work was done in the capital city itself so well known were these plans to hatch secession and set up a rival government that the work of submitting the proposed thirteenth amendment appeared ridiculous and was practically suspended apparently the only effect these efforts at conciliation had on the south was to convince the leaders of that section that secession would be an easy task and that soon the north would recognize the independence of the southern confederacy and an empire founded on slavery would be an assured fact the way the compromise schemes of men in dealing with great moral issues are sometimes overruled for wider and more enduring good is illustrated in the fate of the thirteenth amendment born in the year of eighteen sixty one by the supposed saviors of the union instead of the amendment with the proverbial unlucky number enthroning slavery the one ratified four years later forever abolished the institution which recognized the ownership of man by man such in brief was the condition of the public mind when mr lincoln became president on the fourth of march eighteen sixty one an understanding of the discouraging and depressing situation in the north is necessary to an appreciation of lincoln's task and will help to account for the way he was forced to weigh and measure public opinion and cautiously deal with it if he was not to find himself a president without a party or a coherent patriotic backing we have now reached mr lincoln's first official utterance as the legally chosen executive of the entire country it is hardly necessary to note the splendid logic with which he exploded the doctrine of succession a brief reference to his attitude toward slavery in the first inaugural is in order as the next step in our story it was mr lincoln's firm opinion that the clause of the constitution relating to persons held to service or labor in one state and escaping into another shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such services do specifically referred to fugitive slaves he also affirmed that it was so intended by those who framed it quote, and said mr lincoln 
the intention of the lawgiver is the law end quote. the president considered that the fourth plank of the platform upon which he was nominated pledged the party to enforce that provision of the constitution the only qualification of this point is the following paragraph of the inaugural quote, again in any law upon this subject ought not all the safeguards of liberty known in civilized and humane jurisprudence to be introduced so that a free man be not in any case surrendered as a slave and might it not be well at the same time to provide by law for the enforcement of that clause in the constitution which guarantees that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states End quote. there is not a hint in the inaugural that the entire constitution would not be faithfully applied by him of course he referred to normal conditions and the orderly providing of constitutional government and could not anticipate a condition of civil war amounting to armed resistance to the government which he had just taken a solemn oath to defend and protect slavery the confederacy's cornerstone the antebellum social institutions of the south rested on slavery while the political prestige of the section was also dependent upon the peculiar institution therefore the election of mr lincoln in 1860 on a platform pledged to the non-extension of slave territory brought to a practical climax theories of secession and nullification which had appeared at intervals as threats during the existence of the republic confined to its existing territory slavery might endure for an indefinite period but the south saw that with no opportunity for expansion the institution was doomed while it might be constitutionally tolerated it was likely to rest under increased moral condemnation for these reasons the moving spirits of the south did not wait for the results of the election of eighteen sixty to be fully known before they began to plan and plot for the dissolution of the union rapidly the movement for the secession of states and the formation of the confederacy took shape many of these plans were conceived and consultation about them went on under the droppings of the national sanctuary if not in the capital itself the purpose of this chapter is rather to see to what extent slavery was the seed of secession than to discuss the ways and means by which the rebellion was organized and forwarded documentary evidence and a wealth of competent opinion are available in considering the case first there is the constitution of the confederacy with the exception of some minor details and its provisions regarding slavery the document was patterned after the old constitution the peculiar institution however had the place of special reference in the fundamental law of the confederacy the provisions of this document recognizing slavery are here given Quote, the citizens of each state shall have the right to transit and sojourn in any state of this confederacy with their slaves and other property and the right of property in said slaves shall not thereby be impaired no slave or other person held to service or labor in any state or territory of the confederate states under the laws thereof escaping or lawfully carried into another shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such slave belongs or to whom such service or labor may be due the confederate states may acquire new territory in all such territory the institution of negro slavery as it now exists in the confederate states shall be recognized and protected by congress and by the territorial government and the inhabitants of the several confederate states and territories shall have the right to take to such territory any slaves lawfully held by them in any of the states or territories of the confederate states End quote. alexander h stevens of georgia on november fourteenth eighteen sixty made a vigorous speech before the state legislature and opposed the secession movement as unwarranted and foolish on january eighteenth eighteen sixty one 
in the convention called to take georgia out of the union mr stevens was among the eighty-nine men who voted against secession having been elected vice president of the confederacy on march twenty first he made a speech the tenure of which warrants the conclusion that he considered slavery the dominant reason for the formation of the southern confederacy we make the following extracts Quote, but not to be tedious in enumerating the numerous changes for the better allow me to allude to one other though last not least the new constitution has put at rest for ever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution african slavery as it exists among us the proper status of the negro in our form of civilization this was the immediate cause of the late rupture and the present revolution End quote. mr stevens admitted that the prevailing ideas entertained by thomas jefferson and most of the leading statesmen of the time of the formation of the old constitution were that the enslavement of the african was in violation of the laws of nature that it was wrong in principle socially morally and politically after declaring that the ideas of the fathers of the republic were fundamentally wrong mr stevens said quote, our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite ideas its foundations are laid its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the negro is not equal to the white man that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition this our new government is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical philosophical and moral truth End quote. however strange this doctrine may sound to twentieth-century ears it leaves no doubt as to what the vice-president of the confederacy thought about the institution of slavery as a permanent condition for the negroes in america but we have more recent and probably more famous evidence regarding slavery as a cause of the civil war the witness in this case is none other than woodrow wilson president of the united states speaking of the election of mr lincoln he says quote, the south had avowedly staked everything even her allegiance to the union upon this election the triumph of mr lincoln was in her eyes nothing less than the establishment in power of a party bent upon the destruction of the southern system and the defeat of southern interests even to the point of countenancing and assisting servile insurrection in the metaphor of senator benjamin the republicans did not mean indeed to cut down the tree of slavery but they meant to gird it about and so cause it to die it seemed evident to the southern men too that the north would not pause or hesitate because of constitutional guarantees the agitation against slavery had spoken in every quarter the harshest moral censures of slavery and the slaveholders the whole course of the south had been described as one of systematic iniquity southern society had been represented as built upon a willful sin the southern people had been held up to the world as those who deliberately despised the most righteous commands of religion they knew that they did not deserve such reprobation they knew that their lives were honorable their relations with their slaves humane their responsibility for the existence of slavery among them remote End quote. probably no man of political foresight in the south doubted the election of lincoln after that section deliberately divided its vote between three pro-slavery candidates so that in so far as it staked anything on the election of eighteen sixty it was with the expectation of just what happened both as to the election itself and the secession movement that followed no more explicit defense of slavery as an institution and of slaveholders as moralists has been uttered since the civil war than is contained in the foregoing extracts the attempt to shift the responsibility for the rebellion to the shoulders of the north may be ingenious but as a justification for secession the claim is neither legally nor logically sound but mr wilson has unequivocally made slavery the cause of the war <laughs>
End of section 4section five of president lincoln's attitude towards slavery and emancipation by henry watson wilbur this librivox recording is in the public domain congress and slavery before emancipation however president lincoln halted before issuing the emancipation proclamation the question of slavery as related to the war did not escape the attention and action of either the executive or legislative branches of the government. The War of the Rebellion had been distracting the country only about a month when the House of Representatives passed the following resolution, quote, that in the judgment of this House it is no part of the duty of soldiers of the United States to capture and return fugitive slaves, end quote. This opinion was not respected or observed by some of our military commanders in the field. In fact, many, if not most, of the West Point men, during the early part of the war, considered slavery a constitutional institution, and they concluded that it must be acknowledged and the slaveholders be protected in holding their property, even by the military power of the government which the same slaveholders had taken up arms to disrupt. Mr. Lincoln sent his first annual message to Congress, December 3, 1861, while he made no reference to general, or what Horace Greeley called, constrained emancipation, a system of colonization was proposed. This plan contemplated settling such blacks as had already or might in the future be freed in consequence of the war in some territory outside the limits of the united states in addition the president also made this suggestion quote, it might be well to consider too whether the free colored people already in the united states could not so far as individuals may desire be included in such colonization End quote. Congress received the recommendation with sufficient seriousness to appropriate $100,000 in aid of the colonization of the freedmen of the District of Columbia. The appropriation carried no tangible result, except that a few blacks were taken to an island on the coast of Haiti, with no apparent advantage to any one except the speculators who undertook the transfer. The day before the receipt of the President's message, an attempt was made to make illegal what might be called slave hunting by the army. The original bill was hotly opposed. Finally, all bills having a similar intent were embodied in an extra article of war, introduced in the House by F. P. Blair, as follows. Quote, all officers are prohibited from employing any of the forces under their respective commands for the purpose of returning fugitives from service or labor who may have escaped from any persons to whom such service or labor is claimed to be due any officer who shall be found guilty by court-martial of violating this article shall be dismissed from the service End quote. This bill was finally passed by both Houses of Congress, and was approved by the President March 6th. Matters relating to slavery moved rather rapidly in Congress. In December 1861, emancipation in the District of Columbia came up for consideration. The bill which was introduced was warmly discussed in both Houses, and finally passed mainly by party majorities. It was approved by the President April 16, 1862. The bill carried a compensation clause and provided payment of $300 each for the slaves thus emancipated. Mr. Lincoln seems to have been greatly impressed with the idea that emancipation would be considered less arbitrary and objectionable if it carried with it compensation for the slaveholders' peculiar property. The very day on which he signed the bill abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia, he sent a special message to Congress asking that both houses adopt the following resolution, quote, Resolved that the United States, in order to cooperate with any state which may adopt gradual abolition of slavery, give to such state 
pecuniary aid to be used by such state in its discretion to compensate it for the inconvenience public and private produced by such change of system End quote. the president's comments upon the provisions of the resolution did not suit the abolitionists and it is quite evident now that they utterly failed in measuring lincoln's mind up to the point of understanding its temper and spirit his far-seeing judgment made him able to see that preventing the recognition of the confederacy by the governments of europe and especially by our own was fundamental to the success of the union cause if the slave states in rebellion or those that had remained loyal refused to accept this reasonable and profitable proposition he felt that he had placed the government in a fair light before the nations a vigorous debate of the resolution occurred in both houses of congress it passed in the house by a vote of eighty nine to thirty one the resolution reached the senate march twentieth and was passed april second by a vote of thirty two to ten the president attached his signature to the measure april tenth eighteen sixty two it should be stated that the union men from the border slave states and the northern democrats generally utterly rejected emancipation even though it had attached the salve of an appropriation what is more no slave state ever made application for the benefits which this resolution proffered an emancipation bill which had been drafted but which had been held in committee for a month was reported to the house on may first eighteen sixty two it provided for the abolition of slavery in all of the unorganized territory of the united states and practically prohibited its introduction into such territory this measure had rather a stormy passage through congress but safely weathered all opposition and was approved by the president june nineteenth congress had provided for the confiscation of such slaves held in the confederate states as were permitted or forced to work on fortifications or other defenses designed to aid the rebellion experience had shown that more drastic treatment of this peculiar kind of property was necessary if every advantage provided by the rules of war was to be taken in dealing with the enemy this feeling took shape in a joint resolution which declared that the president and all officers in command under him have the right to emancipate the slaves held in any military district in a state of insurrection against the national government this resolution was suggested early in december eighteen sixty one the proposition encountered much opposition in both houses of congress finally it was considered by a conference committee and a new bill quite as drastic was agreed to it passed both houses and was approved by the president april twenty fourth eighteen sixty two a series of laws dealing with negroes and ex-slaves rapidly found their way through congress one provided for the education of colored children in the district of columbia this measure carried a rider which gave negroes in the district the same status before the law as was accorded white people in january eighteen sixty two president lincoln ordered the marshal of the district of columbia not to quote, receive into custody any persons caught up as fugitives from slavery but to discharge within ten days all such persons then in jail end quote the discussions on some of the foregoing bills were fine samples of prejudicial faint-hearted and pessimistic statesmanship all sorts of dire calamities were predicted because of an affirmation of the right of emancipation as a war measure all of these predictions were uttered by northern men to expect to reconstruct the republic without the institution of slavery was pronounced the dream of a madman in fact the pent-up evil spirit of slavery uttered its most bitter denunciation on the eve of its being cast out of the national body slavery and the army apart from points where legislation in congress related to slavery and the war footing the question came up directly in the army in more ways than one 
we have already seen that any expectation or attempt to keep the disturbing element in the background was a sorry disappointment from the start. General Benjamin F. Butler assumed command of the Union forces at Fortress Monroe in May 1861. Very soon after, three slaves came inside the lines, saying they were claimed by one of the commissioned officers in the Confederate Army. The colored men said that they were about to be sent to North Carolina to work on the Confederate fortifications in that state. General Butler heard their story and promptly declared, quote, These men are contraband of war. End quote. The word contraband, as used by Butler, became almost a household word during the Civil War. The return of the slaves was demanded and promptly refused. General Butler then referred the matter to the War Department at Washington, stating that all such persons coming to us could be profitably employed within the Union lines. The general commanding wanted to know what should be done with contrabands. Secretary Cameron promptly replied, and in his letter of instruction, among other things, said, quote, You will, on the other hand, so long as any state within which your military operations are conducted remains under the control of such armed combinations, refrain from surrendering to alleged masters any person or persons who come within your lines. You will employ such persons in the services to which they will be best adapted, keeping an account of the labor by them performed, of the value of it, and the expense of their maintenance. The question of their final disposition will be referred for future determination. End quote. While this position taken by the War Department greatly clarified the situation, it did not produce the weakening effect on the Confederacy which many enthusiasts expected. If all the military commanders had applied the rule as vigorously and sympathetically as Butler did, the case might have been different. But in any case, those who fancied that the rebellion could be put down in a quick and easy fashion were expecting the impossible. There were military commanders who went beyond any act of Congress, or any avowed purpose of the President, in proclaiming freedom to the slaves. General Fremont was first to take such action. In September 1861, after he had taken command of the Union forces in Missouri, he issued a general order, in which he said, quote, The property, real and personal, of all persons in the state of Missouri, who shall take up arms against the United States, or shall be directly proven to have taken active part with their enemies in the field, is declared to be confiscated to the public use, and their slaves, if any they have, are hereby declared free men. End quote. This military act of emancipation was annulled by President Lincoln, in which the general was practically commanded to make his order go no further than the act of Congress of August 6, 1861, relating to the confiscation of property used for insurrectionary purposes. There were a few minor exhibitions of radical action regarding slavery by men, most of the guilty parties being either reprimanded or punished. General David Hunter succeeded to the command of the military department, with headquarters at Hilton Head, South Carolina, in April 1862. On the ninth of the following month, Hunter issued General Order No. 11. In this document, he declared the states of Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina under martial law, saying that, quote, Slavery and martial law in a free country are altogether incompatible. The persons in these states, heretofore held as slaves, are therefore declared forever free. End quote. Ten days after the date of this military order, President Lincoln issued a proclamation in which he annulled the Hunter Army Order on the ground that no military commander had any authority inherent or delegated to emancipate slaves in the states. In this proclamation, Mr. Lincoln probably gave the first official intimation that a general emancipation proclamation might be issued. 
he clearly declared that whatever might be done in this particular he reserved the doing of it to himself as commander-in-chief of the army and navy and would not feel justified in leaving it to the decision of commanders in the field the major part of this proclamation was confined to rehearsing the joint resolution passed by congress in march of that year providing for gradual compensated emancipation coupled with a statement of fact regarding the offer to the slave states was a most tender appeal to the citizens of those states mentioned in general hunter's order the president thus closed his proclamation quote, this proposal makes common cause for a common object casting no reproaches upon any it acts not the pharisee the change it contemplates would come gently as the dews of heaven not rending or wrecking anything will you not embrace it so much good has not been done by one effort in all past time as in the providence of god it is now your high privilege to do may the vast future not have to lament that you have neglected it End quote. it should be remembered that this almost pathetic overture to the men most surely to be benefited was made only four months before the initial draft of the emancipation proclamation was announced mr lincoln's increasing attitude of mind from this time on until the twenty second of september seems to have deliberately paved the way for emancipation by throwing the burden of blame upon those who would not listen to reason or meet a humane government and a kindly executive halfway in making more easy the inevitable end of the institution of slavery approaching emancipation on the twelfth of july eighteen sixty two president lincoln made his final appeal to the border states to accept compensated emancipation it seems that he felt in advance that his offer would avail nothing but he was determined to make it easy for the slave states which had remained loyal to the union to easily meet the new conditions the following day the funeral of a young child of secretary stanton was held in going out to the stanton residence mr lincoln rode in a carriage with secretary wells and secretary seward it was on this ride that mr lincoln first broached the subject of emancipation by proclamation to any members of his cabinet up to this time he had rather vigorously objected to any interference of the general government with the institution of slavery eight days later on the twenty first the matter came up and he urged a sort of qualified and compensated emancipation with an attached scheme for colonizing the freed negroes in some tropical or semi-tropical region at a cabinet meeting held on the twenty second the president expressed aversion to arming negroes like other soldiers mr lincoln's biographers without trying to analyze the development of his mind in speaking of this cabinet meeting make this statement quote, but on the kindred policy of emancipation the president had reached a decision which appears to have been in advance of the views of his entire cabinet End quote. at this cabinet meeting the following first draft of an emancipation proclamation was read quote, in pursuance of the sixth section of the act of congress entitled quote, an act to suppress insurrection and to punish treason and rebellion to seize and confiscate property of rebels and for other purposes end quote, approved july seventeenth eighteen sixty two and which act and the joint resolution explanatory thereof are herewith published i abraham lincoln president of the united states do hereby proclaim to and warn all persons within the contemplation of said sixth section to cease participating in aiding countenancing or abetting the existing rebellion or any rebellion against the government of the united states and to return to their proper allegiance to the united states on pain of the forfeitures and seizures as within and by said sixth section provided and i hereby make known that it is my purpose 
upon the next meeting of congress to again recommend the adoption of a practical measure for tendering pecuniary aid to the free choice or rejection of any and all states which may then be recognizing and practically sustaining the authority of the united states and which may then have voluntarily adopted or thereafter may voluntarily adopt gradual abolishment of slavery within such state or states that the object is to practically restore thenceforward to be maintained the constitutional relation between the general government and each and all the states wherein that relation is now suspended or disturbed and that for this object the war as it has been will be prosecuted and as a fit and necessary military measure for effecting this object i commander-in-chief of the army and navy of the united states do order and declare that on the first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three all persons held as slaves within any state or states wherein the constitutional authority of the united states shall not then be practically recognized submitted to and maintained shall then thenceforward and forever be free End quote. the only record in existence of this important meeting is a single page of notes made by mr stanton the notes are very incomplete but are definite enough to convey undisputed information according to this memoranda seward opposed issuing the proclamation on account of the effect it would have on foreign nations he said that some of them would intervene because of cotton the evident meaning being that to stop slavery would result in curtailing the production of that staple mr chase pronounced the measure one of great danger but just why the stanton statement does not tell us it would seem that the original draft of the emancipation proclamation quoted in this chapter and the real document issued two months later were president lincoln's own act we have good evidence at hand regarding this matter in the person of mr lincoln's secretary of the navy who says quote, after his election and after the war commenced events forced upon him the emancipation of the slaves in the rebellion states it was his own act a bold step an executive measure originating with him and was as stated in the memorable appeal at the close of the final proclamation invoking for it the considerate judgment of mankind warranted alone by military necessity the original draft of the proclamation manifestly incomplete in form seems to have been pigeonholed for the time being it is hardly conceivable that it was forgotten there has been a popular notion abroad that adversity had followed the fortunes of the union forces during the first half of the year eighteen sixty two but such is not the fact it must be remembered that the capture of forts donelson and henry the capture of roanoke island and new Bern, the battles of shiloh and corinth the capture of island number no. ten fall of new orleans the reoccupation of norfolk and a whole list of minor successful engagements in the southwest happened during this period on march eighth eighteen sixty two occurred the battle between the monitor and the merrimac when the confederates vacated norfolk shortly after the merrimac was scuttled and that scourge of the sea disappeared the real discouragement in prosecuting the war at this time was the failure of the army of the potomac to meet expectations this may be admitted without stopping to take part in the long-lived mcclellan controversy there was also national and official nervousness regarding the safety of washington with the confederate army of virginia roaming around inflicting damage and a constant source of danger if mcclellan did not capture richmond there was the fear that lee would move on and possess the national capital end of section five section six of president lincoln's attitude toward slavery and emancipation 
by Henry Watson Wilbur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Laboring with Lincoln. Apparently, no publicity was given at the time to the rough draft of an Emancipation Proclamation given in the previous chapter. The anti slavery papers of the period make no mention of it and such books as Greeley's American Conflict make no reference to such a document. The months of July and August, 1862, were characterized by phenomenal activity on the part of the ultra-abolitionists. The milder anti-slavery men, and not a few church bodies, either sent memorials or had delegates make pilgrimages to Washington to try and convince Mr. Lincoln that the way to break the back of the rebellion was to break the shackles of the slave had they known the prophetic document sleeping in a presidential pigeonhole some of those who scolded the president might have been more gentle in speech and action garrison's liberator in its issue of july twenty five declared quote, the president can by a single word and in a single week reduced the rebel army to one-half its present number." End quote. The magical word was, of course, emancipation. In another column on the same page of the same issue, the liberator said, quote, But the government is practically false to itself, blind as a bat to its true line of policy, stumbling, halting, prevaricating, irresolute, weak, besotted. End quote. Civilians, non resistance, preachers, agitators were all telling how the war should be waged and victories won. While the anti slavery standard was much more gentle in its criticism, it was equally positive in advising emancipation as the speedy cure for all our national ills. The progressive friends of Longwood, Pennsylvania, sent a delegation to washington to labor with the president evidently some time in june the report of this visit as given in the new york tribune indicates that he argued the point with his visitors and stated as one of his reasons for not issuing an emancipation proclamation that such a decree quote, could not be more binding upon the south than the constitution and that cannot be enforced in that part of the country now. End quote. This statement was most vigorously criticized and condemned by the abolitionists. On the 17th of June, a committee representing the Reformed Presbyterian Church Synod had an interview with Mr. Lincoln, and presented resolutions on the subject of slavery, which the Synod had adopted this committee approached the president sympathetically and received from him an appreciative reply he assured the committee that he had no disagreement with them regarding slavery as an evil but intimated that when getting rid of a long established institution was the issue the method of action was not so plain and admitted of honest difference of opinion then he said to his visitors quote, feeling deeply my responsibility to my country, and to that God to whom we all owe allegiance, I assure you I will try to do my best, and so may God help me." End quote. The way Lincoln was assailed during this period is plainly illustrated in the current periodicals, and especially those of pronounced abolition proclivities. In its edition of August 9, the anti-slavery standard pronounced President Lincoln utterly ignorant of the situation, and said that he was misled by others. Later the standard printed an article from the New York Independent, written by Henry Ward Beecher, criticizing Mr. Lincoln. In this article, the great Brooklyn preacher, among other things, said, quote, Mr. Lincoln is a good man, a considerate, prudent, honest politician but not a spark of genius has he not an element for leadership not one particle of heroic enthusiasm End quote. mr beecher then proceeded to make light of the messages and state papers of mr lincoln 
marking this statement quote, there has not been a line in any government paper that might not have been issued by the czar by louis napoleon or by jeff davis our state papers during this eventful struggle are void of genuine enthusiasm for the great doctrines on which this government was founded End quote. on the first of august eighteen sixty two a celebration of british emancipation in the west indies was held in abington massachusetts a good deal of the speech-making was either in criticism or caricature of mr lincoln one of the speakers was rev moncure d conway who repudiated the theory of a representative man and intimated that the need was for a super representative man he found fault with the president because he proclaimed that negroes should work in the army camps because he was forced to it when he should have done so on his own motion having been in washington he said quote, i got an idea a thing which is rarely known in that region of country End quote. continuing he said quote, the ancients had a fable that the world rested on an elephant and the elephant on a tortoise now the ancients had a vision of this country when they said that the elephant is our army and the only disagreeable fact about it is that the army rests on abraham lincoln and if he is not a tortoise there never was one made by god almighty it is impossible for abraham lincoln to move faster than the tortoise he has tried it and it is no go he has got a heavy shell on his back he got it at his birth for that is the kind of animal that grows in kentucky End quote. We have not paid any attention to the vituperation of the pro-slavery press or orators. There was no reason to expect that they would do other than make Mr. Lincoln's task as difficult as possible. The President kept on the even tenor of his way, revolving the cause and its need in his mind, not wearing his heart on his sleeve, but patiently bearing the burdens that were his. Half of the month of August was gone when the storm broke from a new if not unexpected quarter to be related in the next chapter lincoln and horace greeley considering the present popularity of president lincoln it seems almost unbelievable that during his official life he was the victim of the most bitter and unfeeling criticism however sincere some of it was at the time we now know that most of it was mistaken and misplaced among the most pointed of lincoln's critics in eighteen sixty two was horace greeley the master spirit of the new york tribune the wide circulation and commanding influence of that paper gave tremendous carrying power to whatever its able editor said the late alexander k mcclure of philadelphia himself a journalist of note, declared, quote, The New York Tribune was then the most influential journal ever published in this country. It was the Republican Bible, and its weekly edition was more read in the West than all other Eastern papers combined. End quote. In the summer of 1862, with the war still raging, when the optimists fancied that it should have fully ceased, President Lincoln was bombarded by anti-slavery men of all sorts to speedily proclaim the abolition of slavery. Greeley was first among the bombarders, and on the 19th of August he published an open letter to the President in the Tribune, entitled, quote, The Prayer of Twenty Millions, end quote. Here are some of its salient features selected by Greeley himself. Quote, on the face of this wide earth mr president there is not one disinterested determined intelligent champion of the union cause who does not feel that all attempts to put down the rebellion and at the same time uphold its inciting cause are preposterous and futile that the rebellion if crushed out to-morrow would be renewed within a year if slavery were left in full vigor that army officers who remain to this day devoted to slavery 
can at least be but halfway loyal to the union and that every hour of deference to slavery is an hour of added and deepened peril to the union i appeal to the testimony of your ambassadors in europe it is freely at your services not mine ask them to tell you candidly whether the seeming subserviency of your policy to the slaveholding slavery upholding interest is not the perplexity the despair of statesmen of all parties and be admonished by the general answer i close as i began with a statement that what an immense majority of the loyal millions of your countrymen require of you is a frank declared unqualified ungrudging execution of the laws of the land more especially of the confiscation act that act gives freedom to the slaves of rebels coming within our lines or whom those lines may at any time enclose we ask you to render it due obedience by publicly requiring all your subordinates to recognize and obey it the rebels are everywhere using the late anti-negro riots in the north as they have long used your officers treatment of negroes in the south to convince the slaves that they have nothing to hope from a union success that we mean in that case to sell them into a bitter bondage to defray the cost of the war let them impress this as a truth on the great mass of their ignorant and credulous bondmen and the union will never be restored never we cannot conquer ten millions of people united in solid phalanx against us powerfully aided by northern sympathizers and european allies we must have scouts guides spies cooks teamsters diggers and choppers from the blacks of the south whether we allow them to fight for us or not or we shall be baffled and repelled as one of the millions who would gladly have avoided this struggle at any sacrifice but that of principle and honor but who now feels that the triumph of the union is indispensable not only to the existence of our country but to the well-being of mankind i entreat you to render a hearty and unequivocal obedience to the law of the land yours horace greeley End quote. on the following day president lincoln replied to the prayer of twenty millions by telegraph a most unusual proceeding for the executive of a great nation in replying to the criticism of a purely private citizen the dispatch was a typical lincoln document and a good sample of his literary style mr lincoln said quote, executive mansion washington august twenty two eighteen sixty two Honorable Horace Greeley, dear sir, I have just read yours of the nineteenth instant, addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact which I may know to be erroneous, I do not now and here controvert them. If there be any inferences which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not now and here argue against them if there be perceptible in it an impatient and dictatorial tone i waive it in deference to an old friend whose heart i have always supposed to be right as to the policy i seem to be pursuing as you say i have not meant to leave any one in doubt i would save the union i would save it in the shortest way under the constitution the sooner the national authority can be restored the nearer the union will be the union as it was if there be those who would not save the union unless they could at the same time save slavery i do not agree with them my paramount object is to save the union and not either to save or destroy slavery if i could save the union without freeing any slave i would do it if i could save it by freeing all the slaves i would do it and if i could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone i would also do that what i do about slavery and the colored race i do because i believe it helps to save this union and what i forbear 
I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I will adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose, according to my views of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Yours, A. Lincoln. End quote. Greeley's letter was probably more widely read and generally discussed than the President's reply. In its caustic criticism and almost brutal bluntness, it really represented the feeling of a large number of intense men. It should be remembered that Horace Greeley was an impulsive idealist. He had little capacity, in a strenuous time of heat and excitement, to weigh or measure Lincoln's ability to be calm and patient, and wait for public opinion to catch up with his idealism. Later on, however, Mr. Greeley, made a handsome confession of his own short-sightedness, coupled with an acknowledgment of President Lincoln's great service to his country. He may have had the prayer of twenty millions in mind when he wrote the following, quote, Though I very heartily supported it when made, I did not favor his renomination for president, for I wanted the war driven onward with vehemence, and this was not in his nature always dreading that the national credit would fail, or the national resolution falter, I feared that his easy ways would allow the rebellion to obtain European recognition and achieve ultimate success. But that divinity that shapes our ends was quietly working out for us a larger and fuller deliverance than I had dared to hope for, leaving to such short-sighted mortals as I no part but to wonder and adore. We have had chieftains who would have crushed the rebellion in six months, and restored the Union as it was. But God gave us the one leader whose control secured not only the downfall of the rebellion, but the eternal overthrow of human slavery under the flag of the great republic. End, quote. End of section 6「Section seven of President Lincoln's Attitude Toward Slavery and Emancipation by Henry Watson Wilbur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Continued Urging and Arguing Matters progressed slowly, but steadily, during the months of August and September. Public meetings of all sorts were held. Ministers fulminated from pulpits and newspapers continued to appeal to the President, not always wisely or well, that the country's case might be met by an act of emancipation on his part. Still, with a sleeping provisional draft of emancipation in his possession, Mr. Lincoln showed no sign that he was about to take the step which soon thrilled the nation. On Sunday evening, the 7th of September, 1862, what the newspapers called a quote, great war meeting of Christians representing all denominations end quote, was held in Chicago. This meeting memorialized the president in dignified but positive language. The memorial noted that emancipation in the District of Columbia and in the unorganized national territory had not met the country's crisis. It therefore prayed the President that as, quote, the only means of preserving the Union to proclaim without delay national emancipation, end quote. Two of the leading clergymen of the city took the memorial to Washington and presented it to Mr. Lincoln on the 13th. There was a discussion at close range between the President and his visitors, touching the merits and practical character of their contention. The arguments at first presented by the executive 
seem strange in connection with the purpose he had expressed at the cabinet meeting held the twenty second of july in the main he cited the manifestly divided public opinion of the country Quote, the subject is difficult he said and good men do not agree End quote. he clearly intimated that the burden on him was very great and the problem was not so easy as those who did not directly have to meet it fancied then he propounded this question quote, now then tell me if you please what possible result of good would follow the issuing of such a proclamation as you desire understand i raise no objections against it on legal or constitutional grounds for as the commander-in-chief of the army and navy in time of war i suppose i have a right to take any measure which may best subdue the enemy nor do i urge objections of a moral nature in view of possible consequences of insurrection and massacre at the south i view this matter as a practical war measure to be decided on according to the advantages or disadvantages it may offer to the suppression of the rebellion End quote. the preacherly pleaders urged the effect an emancipation proclamation would have in making sentiment favorable to the union cause in europe they also affirmed that such action would justify an appeal quote, to the god of the oppressed and downtrodden for his blessing end quote, upon our efforts to end the rebellion by crushing slavery mr lincoln responded by an expressed desire to stimulate union feeling especially in the border states he intimated that we possessed an quote, important principle to rally and unite the people in the fact that constitutional government is at stake this is a fundamental idea going down about as deep as anything End quote. the discussion continued the president closing the conference with these sober and searching words quote, do not misunderstand me because i have mentioned these objections they indicate the difficulties that have thus far prevented my action in some such way as you desire i have not decided against a proclamation of liberty to the slaves but hold the matter under advisement and i can assure you that the subject is on my mind by day and by night more than any other whatever shall appear to be god's will i will do i trust that in the freedom with which i have canvassed your views i have not in any respect injured your feelings End quote. an explanation of the purpose of mr lincoln in this talk with the chicago clergyman is made by one of his biographers who says quote, for the purpose of fully elucidating their views he started objections to the policy they urged and in accordance with his old practice at the bar he made an argument against his own views and against the policy he had nearly or quite concluded to pursue End quote. in the midst of these weeks of pleading in which passion and prejudice were often so manifest there were utterances sane and sober christian and kindly which went to the centre of the whole matter in this class belonged a sermon preached in ebbett hall new york sunday september fourteenth by rev o b frothingham we do not know that mr lincoln ever read this sermon but if he did it must have impressed him much more than the superfluity of scolding with which he was visited mr frothingham made a touching and gentle plea for faith in men for confidence in the moral virtues and for the spirit of kindness we quote a sample of the preacher's noble utterance quote, on the one hand there is far too little of the christian feeling which bids us forgive our enemies on the other there is far too little of the christian feeling that bids us recognize the manhood of the poor and weak there is too much vindictiveness toward the slave owner too little consideration for the slave fatal either to the noblest success doubly fatal to both.
we must overcome these two formidable obstacles we must generate force enough to overcome them we can generate if we will the capacity for it is in us the materials for it are in us they are ready to be used we need faith to use them when the son of man cometh he cometh at midnight and it is not midnight yet will he find this faith i believe he will in spite of all that is said to be the contrary the belief deepens that the significance of slavery in this conflict is seen with more and more distinctness that the character of slavery is viewed with more and more detestation that the resolution to have done with slavery knocks louder and louder at the gates of washington that the answer to that resolution will soon come from the occupant of the white house End quote. it seemed to us that this story would be one-sided and possibly overdrawn if it did not contain some account of the kindlier spirit which was present in the country in that strenuous time mr frothingham had faith in lincoln and success for the cause when others faltered and suggested failure six days after the visit of the chicago clergyman president lincoln received two members of the religious society of friends from southern ohio they were isaac and sarah harvey isaac made the journey to washington under what friends call a deep religious concern in eighteen sixty one he made a trip on horseback through sections of the south that he might know the real condition of the oppressed negroes these venerable friends were found on a street in washington by secretary chase and an arrangement for an interview with the president was made for them the following day we do not know just what happened in detail between the great president and the plain friends isaac harvey in his simple narrative of his experience said quote, of that half hour it does not become me to speak i will think of it gratefully throughout eternity at last we had to go the president took a hand of each of us in his saying quote, i thank you for this visit may god bless you End quote. was there ever greater condescension than that just then i asked him if he would object to writing just a line or two certifying that i had fulfilled my mission so that i could show it to the council at home he sat down to his table End quote. the note given by mr lincoln to the harveys is as follows quote, i take pleasure in asserting that i have had profitable intercourse with friend isaac harvey and his good wife sarah harvey may the lord comfort them as they have sustained me abraham lincoln september nineteen eighteen sixty two End quote. considering mr lincoln's susceptibility to religious and spiritual influences it is quite conceivable that the meeting with friend harvey may have helped prepare the way for the emancipation proclamation issued three days later more incidents regarding the proclamation some of the statements in regard to the preparation of the emancipation proclamation are undoubtedly based on the story of frank carpenter the artist in the winter of eighteen sixty four he went to washington to paint the picture signing the proclamation for six months he was a daily visitor at the white house and occupied a room in it as an improvised studio it was carpenter's plan to get from the president a pretty clear idea of the way the plan and purpose of the proclamation developed in his mind and these scraps of information are given by carpenter in his book six months at the white house with abraham lincoln this is the statement put into the mouth of lincoln by carpenter Quote, it had got to be said he midsummer eighteen sixty two things had gone on from bad to worse until i felt that we had reached the end of our rope on the plan of operations we had been pursuing that we had about played our last card and must change our tactics or lose the game i now determined upon the adoption of the emancipation policy 
and without consultation with or the knowledge of the cabinet i prepared the original draft of the proclamation and after much anxious thought called a cabinet meeting upon the subject this was the last of july or the first part of the month of august eighteen sixty two the exact date he did not remember this cabinet meeting took place i think upon saturday all were present excepting mr blair the postmaster general who was absent at the opening of the discussion but came in subsequently i said to the cabinet that i had resolved upon this step and had not called them together to ask their advice but to lay the subject matter of a proclamation before them suggestions as to which would be in order after they had heard it read mr lovejoy said he was in error when he informed you that it excited no comment excepting on the part of secretary seward various suggestions were offered secretary chase wished the language stronger in reference to the arming of the blacks mr blair after he came in deprecated the policy on the ground that it would cost the administration the fall elections nothing however was offered that i had not already fully anticipated and settled in my own mind until secretary seward spoke he said in substance quote, mr president i approve of the proclamation but i question the expediency of its issue at this juncture the depression of the public mind consequent upon our repeated reverses is so great that i fear the effect of so important a step it may be viewed as the last measure of an exhausted government a cry for help the government stretching forth its hands to ethiopia instead of ethiopia stretching forth her hands to the government End quote. his idea said the president was that it would be considered our last shriek on the retreat this was his precise expression quote, now continued mr seward while i approve the measure i suggest sir that you postpone its issue until you can give it to the country supported by military success instead of issuing it as would be the case now upon the greatest disasters of the war End quote. mr lincoln continued quote, the wisdom of the view of the secretary of state struck me with very great force it was an aspect of the case that in all my thought upon the subject i had entirely overlooked the result was that i put the draft of the proclamation aside as you do your sketch for a picture waiting for a victory from time to time i added or changed a line touching it up here and there anxiously waiting the progress of events well the next news we had was of pope's disaster at bull run things looked darker than ever finally came the week of the battle of antietam i determined to wait no longer the news came i think on wednesday that the advantage was on our side i was then staying at the soldiers home three miles out of washington here i finished writing the second draft of the preliminary proclamation came up on saturday called the cabinet together to hear it and it was published the following monday End quote. there are points in this statement which do not seem to tally with the notes made regarding the july cabinet meeting by secretary stanton it should be remembered that carpenter is reporting off-hand conversation with lincoln both men relied very largely on memory the stanton record constitutes better evidence as to what happened at the meeting in question than any other data we possess according to carpenter mr lincoln said that changes in phraseology in the draft of the proclamation were suggested by secretary seward the original wording of lincoln was to the effect that the government of the united states in all of its branches will recognize the freedom of such negroes as were included in the emancipation proclamation mr seward suggested that the words and maintain be inserted after the word recognize on the insistence of the secretary the two words were inserted 
Mr. Lincoln explained that his failure to employ the word maintain was, quote, because it is not my way to promise what I was not entirely sure I could perform, end quote. In this statement, we have a clear revelation of both the intellectual and moral honesty of President Lincoln. Seward's suggested addition to the proclamation was made at a cabinet meeting held on September 20th, two days before the document of freedom was issued. Nothing contained in the Carpenter's story tends to disprove the claim that the July draft was Mr. Lincoln's individual act and not the suggestion of any member of his cabinet. It was in the latter part of August that Owen Lovejoy, who represented Mr. Lincoln's district in the lower house of Congress, called on the President. At the threshold of the White House he met Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania. Mr. Stevens was urged to accompany Lovejoy, but declined, saying, quote, No, it is a time when you must talk to him alone. End quote. Lovejoy says that the President's expression was far more earnest, the lines deeper on his careworn face, than usual. Mr. Lincoln hinted that perhaps he ought to take the field, and stand or fall with the men. This proposition was strongly discouraged by Lovejoy. The position taken by Greeley, in his prayer of twenty millions, was discussed, and rather approved by the congressmen. They talked plainly over slavery and the war situation. Lovejoy urged the President to follow God's warnings as he understood them. Mr. Lincoln then made this statement, quote, In all of it, if the administration, or myself, for which I assume the greater responsibility, has made a mistake about slavery, it has not been from negligence or avoidable delay. On the contrary, it has been uppermost in my mind. I know that you do not wish me to say more now than this, but I do want to assure you that it will be settled, so far as I can determine and take it, in the course and judgment upon it, that you say is righteous and just, that it is God's conflict, that, as he gives us light, so shall it be." End quote. The interview closed with a season of prayer, in which Lovejoy says, quote, We laid our cause before God, who made and built the nation, whom we have trusted so long. End quote. There were other interviews between the President and his member of Congress, before the memorable day in September. At one of these, Lincoln seems to have been greatly moved. He said he had taken the matter to God, and then saw clearly, as in a vision, that slavery was to be stricken, and practically by his official act. Then came Antietam, and this semblance of a Union victory, for which the President had waited as for the psychological moment in which to issue the proclamation. In the midst of the opinions and counter-opinions regarding Lincoln and emancipation, a new, if not a strange, witness appears in the person of the late George W. Julian, who says, quote, Few subjects have been more debated and less understood than the proclamation of emancipation. Mr. Lincoln was himself opposed to the measure, and when he very reluctantly issued the preliminary proclamation in September 1862, he wished it distinctly understood that the deportation of the slaves was, in his mind, inseparably connected with the policy. End quote. That President Lincoln tenaciously held to the old Whig Party idea of compensated emancipation admits of no doubt. That he held to the purpose of deportation with any strenuous definiteness at the time he issued the proclamation is by no means so clear. In his public utterances, gathered in complete works, we find but two references to deportation. One is in the famous Cooper Union speech, delivered in New York, February 27, 1860. His reference is a clear-cut quotation from Thomas Jefferson, and is as follows, quote, It is still in our power to direct the process of emancipation and deportation peaceably. 
and in such slow degrees that the evil will wear off insensibly in their places the negroes b paripasu filled up by free white laborers if on the contrary it is left to force itself on human nature must shudder at the prospect held up End quote. that lincoln in 1860 and long after hoped that freedom might be slowly and safely secured is in line with his hopeful and peaceable spirit it is surely suggestive that jefferson saw what would happen in sorrow touching slavery if the evil was not disposed of in the domain of common sense and the common conscience the second reference to deportation is in the message of eighteen sixty two with which we shall deal later on he says quote, this ought not to be regarded as objectionable on the one hand or on the other inasmuch as it comes to nothing unless by the mutual consent of the people to be deported and the american voters through their representatives in congress End quote. we leave the matter of lincoln and deportation to be passed upon by the judgment of the reader in the light of the weight of general evidence as to lincoln's mind regarding slavery herein presented End of section seven. Section eight of President Lincoln's Attitude Toward Slavery and Emancipation by Henry Watson Wilbur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Proclamation of Freedom. When the Emancipation Proclamation was given to the country on the twenty second of September, eighteen sixty two, it took both an expectant and the skeptical public opinion by surprise reasonably justifying those whose faith in the president had never faltered it will be noted that in the second paragraph of the proclamation mr lincoln reiterates the position and purpose contained in the provisional draft of july twenty second the strong position taken in the document given below regarding the enforcement of the laws of congress relating to slaves and the treatment of the property of those in rebellion against the government of the united states probably had as a salutary effect upon public opinion as the announced act of emancipation itself the following is the complete text of the emancipation proclamation Quote, i abraham lincoln president of the united states of america and commander-in-chief of the army and navy thereof do hereby proclaim and declare that hereafter as heretofore the war will be prosecuted for the object of practically restoring the constitutional relation between the united states and each of the states and the people thereof in which states that relation is or may be suspended or disturbed that it is my purpose upon the next meeting of congress to again recommend the adoption of a practical measure tendering pecuniary aid to the free acceptance or rejection of all slave states so called the people whereof may not then be in rebellion against the united states and which states may then have voluntarily adopted or thereafter may voluntarily adopt immediate or gradual abolishment of slavery within their respective limits and that the effort to colonize persons of african descent with their consent upon this continent or elsewhere with the previously obtained consent of the governments existing there will be continued that on the first day of january in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty three all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the united states shall be then thenceforward and forever free and the executive government of the united states including the military and naval authority thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom that the executive will 
on the first day of january aforesaid by proclamation designate the states and parts of states if any in which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the united states and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the congress of the united states by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated shall in the absence of strong countervailing testimony be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the united states that attention is hereby called to an act of congress entitled an act to make an additional article of war approved march thirteenth eighteen sixty two and which act is in the words and figures following quote, be it enacted by the senate and house of representatives of the united states of america in congress assembled that hereafter the following shall be promulgated as an additional article of war for the government of the army of the united states and shall be obeyed and observed as such section one all officers or persons in the military or naval service of the united states are prohibited from employing any of the forces under their respective commands for the purpose of returning fugitives from service or labor who may have escaped from any persons to whom such service or labor is claimed to be due and any officer who shall be found guilty by a court-martial of violating this article shall be dismissed from the service section two and be it further enacted that this act shall take effect from and after its passage End quote. also to the ninth and tenth sections of an act entitled an act to suppress insurrection to punish treason and rebellion to seize and confiscate property of rebels and for other purposes approved july sixteenth eighteen sixty two and which sections are in the words and figures following quote, section nine and be it further enacted that all slaves of persons who shall hereafter be engaged in rebellion against the government of the united states or who shall in any way give aid or comfort thereto escaping from such persons and taking refuge within the lines of the army and all slaves captured from such persons or deserted by them and coming under the control of the government of the united states and all slaves of such persons found on or being within any place occupied by rebel forces and afterward occupied by forces of the united states shall be deemed captives of war and shall be forever free of their servitude and not again held as slaves section ten and be it further enacted that no slave escaping into any state territory or the district of columbia from any other state shall be delivered up or in any way impeded or hindered of his liberty except for crime or some offence against the laws unless the person claiming said fugitive shall first make oath that the person to whom the labor or service of such fugitive is alleged to be due is his lawful owner and has not borne arms against the united states in the present rebellion nor in any way given aid and comfort thereto and no person engaged in the military or naval service of the united states shall under any pretense whatever assume to decide on the validity of the claim of any person to the service or labor of any other person or surrender up any such person to the claimant on pain of being dismissed from the service End quote. and i do hereby enjoin upon and order all persons engaged in the military and naval service of the united states to observe obey and enforce within their respective spheres of service the act and sections above recited
and the executive will in due time recommend that all citizens of the united states who shall have remained loyal thereto throughout the rebellion shall upon the restoration of the constitutional relation between the united states and their respective states and people if that relation shall have been suspended or disturbed be compensated for all losses by acts of the united states including the loss of slaves in witness whereof i have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the united states to be affixed done at the city of washington this twenty-second day of september in the year of our lord one thousand eight hundred and sixty-two and of the independence of the united states the eighty-seventh by the president abraham lincoln william h seward secretary of state end quote. it will be noted that the long-time position of mr lincoln in behalf of compensation to loyal slaveholders is prominent in the document quoted above it was the flea in the ointment in the estimation of the advanced abolitionists it appears that the foregoing proclamation was considered by mr lincoln simply the necessary and logical result of what the members of his cabinet knew had been on his mind for two months secretary chase says that mr lincoln told them that he did not wish their quote, advice about the main matter for that i have determined for myself end quote. all that he intimated he desired was suggestions as to phraseology from published statements of secretary of the navy wells it seems that the stanton notes on the cabinet meeting of july twenty two as to those who opposed the proclamation are substantially correct at the final meeting of the cabinet september twenty two there was a practical agreement as to the policy of emancipation although postmaster general blair objected to the time fixed but no objections were filed by him quote, lest they should be subjected to misconstruction end quote. when the proclamation was read in washington a profound interest was manifested on the evening of the twenty fourth the president was serenaded at the white house being called upon for a speech he very briefly responded as follows quote, i appear before you to do little more than acknowledge the courtesy you pay me and to thank you for it i have not been distinctly informed why it is that on this occasion you appear to do me this honor though i suppose it is because of the proclamation what i did i did after a very full deliberation and under a very heavy and solemn sense of responsibility i can only trust in god i have made no mistake i shall make no attempt on this occasion to sustain what i have done or said by any comment it is now for the country and the world to pass judgment and maybe take action upon it End quote. thus modestly and gently did the author of the emancipation proclamation consign his great act to the judgment of his own generation and posterity the proclamation's reception a perfect confusion of tongues followed the publication of the president's proclamation the republican newspapers joined in a general chorus of praise and in the main the religious newspapers were equally strong in their approval the ultra-democratic press which had given aid and comfort to the nation's enemy in the field by building a backfire of opinion against the administration of mr lincoln distributed literature more or less frenzied and put out prophecies of evil without stint it is pretty certain that both the president's friends and foes expected too much of the proclamation more in fact than it could possibly accomplish in either direction among the newspapers in the north which persisted in rendering a sixteenth century opinion the new york world was very near the head of the class it declared that quote, president lincoln has swung loose from the constitutional moorings of his inaugural address we regret for his sake we lament for the sake of the country that he has been coerced by the insanity of the radicals by the denunciation of their presses 
by the threats of their governors and senators that he should resign into a proclamation which on its face violates the constitution is contrary to the general current of civilization in the conduct of war as it has run since the crusades is in opposition to the solemn declarations made by our government that it was not to be a war of subjugation End quote. It should be noted that the assumption that if the forces of the Union persisted in intending to defeat the armies of the Confederacy, the whole transaction became a war of subjugation, was the pet plea of many democratic orators and organs during the four years of our national struggle. Several newspapers in New York, and some in Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and other northern states, either opposed the proclamation or attempted to ridicule it out of court. Some of the critics, like the New York Journal of Commerce, considered themselves, and those they represented, the divinely appointed saviors of the country, from the wrath and ruin of the radicals. This paper thus patted itself and its friends on the back. Quote, we must not betray the trust confided in us by God, for as surely as he reigns, the hope of America to-day is, under him, only in the conservative men of the North, and our duty to him demands that we stand firm to sustain the great responsibility, when radicalism, failing, sinks crushed, as it will now within a brief period. End quote. Opposition to the proclamation in Pennsylvania was well represented by the Harrisburg Union, which said, quote, Greeley, Sumner, and company have triumphed. Abolition is rampant in the administration, in Congress, wherever their influence could prevail. The proclamation of the President is an outrage upon the humanity and good sense of the country, to say nothing of its gross unconstitutionality. End quote. It is worth noting that regarding allegiance to the Republican Party, the Keystone State halted between two opinions, until the economic issue had become dominant, as practically affecting the state's industrial interests. On the Confederate side of the line, there was what amounted to a hysteria of madness regarding Mr. Lincoln's proclamation. A resolution was introduced in the Confederate Senate, September 29, 1862 pronouncing the document, quote, a gross violation of the usages of civilized warfare, end quote, and an act which should be, quote, held up to the execration of mankind, and counteracted by such severe retaliatory measures as in the judgment of the President, Jefferson Davis, may be best calculated to secure its withdrawal or arrest its execution, end quote. This was considered too mild by the fire-eaters. Mr. Clark, who seems to have come from Missouri, said, quote, He thought the President should be authorized immediately to proclaim that every person found in arms against the Confederate government and its institutions on our soil should be put to death. End quote. All sorts of retaliatory measures were suggested, among them the following, quote, Every white person who shall act as a commissioned or non-commissioned officer commanding negroes or mulattoes against the Confederate States, or who shall arm, organize, train, or prepare negroes or mulattoes for military service, or aid them in any military enterprise against the Confederate States, shall, if captured, suffer death. End quote. The Southern newspapers wasted no choice language in condemning the proclamation. The Richmond Inquirer of October 1, 1862, among other things, said, quote, Butler has been called infamous. By common consent, he is known as the beast. But Butler is a saint compared to his master. In addition to all that Butler authorized, Lincoln adds butchery, even the butchery of babes. Language is too poor to furnish a name suitable for such a character. Nay, the whole catalogue of dishonouring epithets is not sufficient to do justice to it. 
murder is a term of honor compared to lincoln's crime End quote. possibly the richmond dispatch of september thirtieth was a little less hysterical but it was none the less positive in condemning the act of emancipation it declared that mr lincoln's act had utterly prostrated quote, the last remnant of what used with so much unction to be termed by the canting knaves of new england the bulwark of our liberties we mean the ridiculous old constitution of the united states End quote. speaking of the north the dispatch said quote, eager as they may be to cut each other's throats they are still more eager to cut ours and to that pious work we may be assured they will devote themselves with all their energy they are already calling for a million more of men and the probability is that they will have them long before christmas we must make up our minds to meet these men and to beat them as we both can and will if they come here End quote. End of section eight. Section nine of President Lincoln's Attitude Toward Slavery and Emancipation by Henry Watson Wilbur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Loyal Opinion On the twenty fourth of September, the governors of a number of loyal states met in conference at altoona pennsylvania it was assumed and asserted by some critics that the knowledge of this gathering on the part of the president hastened the proclamation but there is the best of reasons for disputing this assumption mr lincoln himself declared that he never thought of the meeting of the governors besides the state executives denied any idea of a political plot nevertheless the meeting of the governors was opportune an address was issued and signed the signatures having been secured by mail after the conference had adjourned there was no disagreement regarding the major propositions of the address but the endorsement of the emancipation policy of the president was objected to by the governors of new jersey maryland kentucky and missouri and was therefore not signed by them it was signed by the executives of twelve states the address expressed hearty devotion to the union and pledged earnest support to the president in overthrowing the rebellion as a matter of course one of the most interesting things to consider at the time was the attitude of the rank and file of the union army toward emancipation there we are confronted by the same confusion of opinion as existed among civilians newspapers like greeley's tribune were sure that quote, the proclamation of the president has electrified the army end quote. a correspondent of the new york times quoted in the anti-slavery standard of october fourth told of a commissioned officer who threatened to resign because of the president's act while others proposed to measure its value according as it helped enlistments and so contributed to a succession of victories necessary to put down the war the boston journal described by the standard as one of the most conservative papers of the country after careful investigation made the following estimate of the situation Quote, the evidence is abundant and we think conclusive that the soldiers belonging to the old regiments who have been longest in the field and who from observation and experience have learned to estimate the strength which slavery has given to the rebels are in favor of emancipating the slaves upon military grounds we doubt not that efforts will be made to sow the seeds of discord in the army but we are confident that these will take root in none of the old regiments End quote. A letter written on the battlefield of Antietam the day after the proclamation was received shows conclusively that a considerable element in the army, presumably the old guard, surely the men from New England, welcomed the news with rejoicing and believed that it was really the beginning of the end of the war. The newspapers which sustained President Lincoln in issuing the proclamation were many, 
in the cities alone two issues of the anti-slavery standard and garrison's liberator contained approving comments from about forty-six journals a number of which did not support the republican party in eighteen sixty and consequently did not favor the election of mr lincoln but after all the most important journalistic support which the administration received from the beginning of the war until its end was from local county newspapers unknown outside of the communities in which they were published at that time the cheap daily paper had not invaded the rural communities there were multitudes of newspapers in towns and villages individually of small circulation but dominated by conviction and moral earnestness and these performed a valuable service in maintaining a correct public sentiment almost unmeasurable the work of the country press in behalf of freedom and union has never been adequately recognized by the historians of the period the influence of such papers as greeley's tribune was of course very great but what they did in a considerable measure was done indirectly through the rural press which restated emphasized and gave local color and support to the facts and arguments which the journals of larger circulation brought to the sanctums of the local editors either every day or twice a week we cannot do better than to close this incomplete review of comment on mr lincoln's proclamation with brief opinions from the two anti-slavery newspaper advocates of the period the anti-slavery standard said editorially quote, while we regret that for the safety and honor of an imperiled nation the president did not see his way clear to proclaim the immediate and unconditional emancipation of every slave on american soil we nevertheless rejoice with an unspeakable joy that he has at last openly committed himself to a measure which if carried out in good faith as we trust it will be must ensure the speedy destruction of the slave system and give us a country free from the damning reproach of making merchandise of the children of god if the object for which the abolitionists have so long prayed and struggled shall be thus attained they will indeed have cause for exultation such as rarely falls to the lot of reformers in this world and putting off the harness the toil-worn veterans in freedom's cause may say in the words of simeon quote, lord now let us thy servant depart in peace for mine eyes have seen thy salvation End quote. End quote. mr garrison was very guarded in the praise which he bestowed on president lincoln's act he said quote, though we believe that this proclamation is not all that the exigencies of the times and the consequent duty of the government require and are consequently not so jubilant over it as many others still it is an important step in the right direction and an act of immense historic consequence and justifies the almost universal gladness of expression and warm congratulation which it has simultaneously elicited in every part of the free states End quote. the liberator feared that the lapse of time would quote, enable jeff davis and his traitorous confederates to anticipate the measure themselves and thus secure their independence by foreign intervention it also vigorously condemned the proclamation's overture to the slave states to sell their slave system at a bargain and its mean absurd and proscriptive device to expatriate the colored population from this their native land End quote. before and after emancipation that president lincoln was the most accurate reader of public opinion among public men of the civil war period is now plain and should have been recognized by his contemporaries better than it was whatever the impatient may have thought or those bent on quarreling with the president may have imagined it is clear that mr lincoln was ahead and not behind 
the average available public sentiment of the north on the slavery question from the time he became president up to and following the emancipation proclamation we have seen that mr lincoln contemplated issuing the proclamation in july eighteen sixty two there may have been as many political as there were military reasons for postponing such action at any rate the conventions of the party opposing the administration took action that could not fail to make a careful man think twice before acting in such a momentous matter the democratic state conventions of eighteen sixty two met the fourth of july in both pennsylvania and ohio here is an extract from the platform adopted by the keystone democrats Quote, the party of fanaticism or crime whichever it may be called that seeks to turn loose the slaves to overrun the north and to enter into competition with the white laboring masses thus degrading their manhood by placing them on an equality with negroes is insulting to our race and merits our most emphatic and unqualified condemnation End quote. ohio democrats practically seconded the conduct of their brethren in pennsylvania while in indiana they were equally vehement against freeing the slaves in addition they declared that the government in indiana in particular was for white men not for black men new york democrats did not talk as bluntly as those mentioned but their hearts beat as one with all those who were trying to bring the administration into contempt and restore the union if at all with slavery intact with all these indications of a public sentiment in four great northern states bent on building a backfire to embarrass the administration it is not strange that mr lincoln waited for the psychological moment in which to make his last moral move against the rebellion still the unwisely optimistic and the ultra opponents of slavery all through the summer of eighteen sixty two insisted that the time for emancipation was overdue and that there was plenty of sentiment in the country to sustain the president should he so act no better sample of the attitude of the impatient can be found than the following Quote, the president whose authority was ample to decree the abolition of slavery from the very commencement of the rebellion and whose influences such divinity doth hedge the chief of a nation would have sufficed to unite the nation into carrying it into effect refrained from action End quote. what is called influence in this paragraph in the large and persuasive sense of that word was never possessed by any president of the united states president lincoln's growing influence came because he did not act on the assumption that a man may wisely do whatever power permits him to do all his influence could have been killed had he simply been bent on driving emancipation through any way but the elections of eighteen sixty two proved conclusively that mr lincoln was really ahead of average public sentiment new york and new jersey elected governors opposed to the national administration and its policies in the congressional and state elections adverse administration majorities were given in pennsylvania ohio indiana and illinois while michigan wisconsin iowa and minnesota gave such reduced republican majorities as to be suggestive if not alarming the congressional elections were also freighted with disappointment for the administration in the states including new york and west to minnesota the republicans lost twenty-one representatives while the republican majority of sixty-four in the lower house of congress dropped from sixty-four to twenty-seven but for the almost solid support the administration received in new england an opposition house might have been elected to hamper mr lincoln it should be said however that other issues and interests operated to cut down support for the administration but possibly no campaign cry was more effective than the charge that there had been a perversion of the war for the union into a war for the negro
objections to conscription, the weight of increasing taxation, the currency, and the high cost of living, by no means a purely twentieth-century complaint, all helped furnish excuses for a vote against the administration. Those who imagine that anything like a dominant anti-slavery or emancipation opinion existed in the North in 1862 base their opinion on insufficient data. Even Horace Greeley, who did all in his power to push the President forward before the fullness of time, makes this suggestive admission. Quote, it is quite probable that had a popular election been held at any time during the year following the 4th of July, 1862, on the question of continuing the war or arresting it on the best attainable terms, a majority would have voted for peace, while it is highly probable that a still larger majority would have voted against emancipation." End quote. If such was the uncertain, if not hostile, attitude of the public mind toward emancipation, the mystery is, why did those who thus saw the situation persist in forcing Mr. Lincoln's hand in the matter? Those whose memories go back to the Civil War period will, we fancy, agree with Greeley's statement, although they will probably not be able to answer the question propounded above. THE MESSAGE OF 1862 On the first Monday in December 1862, President Lincoln sent his second annual message to Congress. It was variously received, but two classes of people objected to it. Those who wanted the Union restored, as it was, did not like it, and the radical abolitionists criticized it severely. The real scope and meaning of the message was evidently not understood by the people at large at the time. It is given small attention by some of Lincoln's early biographers, and yet it now appears one of the most suggestive documents of Lincoln's official life. This message referred briefly to the colonization scheme which had been passed by Congress, and Mr. Lincoln admitted that it had not been a satisfactory success. Quoting the initial draft of the Emancipation Proclamation, he launched a new compensated emancipation scheme. This was formulated as a suggested amendment to the United States Constitution. It provided that any state which should abolish slavery before the year 1900 should receive compensation for its slaves in the shape of interest-bearing government bonds. All slaves, however, that had been freed by the chances of war at any time before the end of the rebellion were to be forever free, but the loyal owners of such slaves were to be compensated for their human property. The amended Constitution also empowered Congress to provide the ways and means for the colonization of emancipated colored people, with their own consent somewhere outside the territory of the United States. Throughout the message there runs a deep desire to be not only just, but generous to the holders of the slaves, and to produce freedom under such guarded conditions as to make the least possible disturbance in the social or economic life of the people. Mr. Lincoln believed that sudden changes in human relationships were not desirable, and were often the causes of serious difficulty. The President quite fully dealt with the future of emancipated slaves, and took up some of the suggested and imaginary dangers to follow in the wake of freedom. He declared that as free men, Negroes would be a no greater economic menace than they had been as slaves, and he held that emancipation, even without deportation, would probably enhance the wages of white labor. Quite unconsciously, of course, Mr. Lincoln anticipated conditions which have appeared at various times since the Civil War. The people in the North declared that the old free states would be overrun by emancipated slaves. Mr. Lincoln dealt with this prediction by asking this question, quote, Why should emancipation South send the freed people North? People of any color seldom run, 
unless there is something to run from. End quote. Mr. Lincoln did not see that the Negroes in the South under freedom would find anything to run from. But finding social, economic, and political injustice, they did run from their old homes, as the increasing black population in northern cities abundantly shows. The breadth of Mr. Lincoln's mind was shown in more ways than one in this message. It was issued within a month of the time when the final and effective Emancipation Proclamation was due. It was the evident purpose of the President to do everything in his power to remove the causes of bitterness which would follow compulsory emancipation. From our present vantage ground it looks as if he felt that if every reasonable proffer he made was ignored or declined, responsibility for what might happen in the future would pass from him to those who declined to meet him halfway. As showing Mr. Lincoln's ability to see all around a situation by considering both sides of a question, we have only to consult this message. In it he practically declared that the North, as well as the South, was responsible for the existence and the continuation of slavery in the Republic, and without ignoring the bad part played by the South in the Civil War, he felt that a lasting and satisfactory freedom could be secured by both sections of the country. That he believed his plan of compensation would be accepted may be doubted from the body of facts which we possess. Among the severest critics of the message of 1862 was William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. It not only found fault with the matter of the document, but with its manner. It seemed to Garrison that the President was taking a back track on the slavery question. The Liberator did not comprehend Lincoln's viewpoint, and was so intent on the ethics involved in the case that it saw literary defects where it fancied there was moral turpitude. Regarding this message, among other things, the Liberator said, quote, In the first place, we maintain that, whatever may be his natural ability, the President is not competent to write his own official papers. It is evident that they are all from his pen, for they all bear the same marks of crudeness, incongruity, feebleness, and lack of method. There is no parallel to them among the state documents to be found in any nation. End quote. So much for a criticism of Lincoln's style, which time has proven unwarranted, and which competent, unprejudiced, contemporaneous opinion should have repudiated. Isaac N. Arnold, member of Congress from Illinois, in passing upon the same message, said, quote, in accordance with the second paragraph of the proclamation, in language which, for statesmanlike views and clearness of statement, will compare favorably with any state paper in American annals, he recalled to the attention of Congress the proposition of compensated emancipation. End quote. If any evidence is needed of the inability of radical abolition prejudice to understand Mr. Lincoln's motives, or to measure his intellectual capacity and moral responsibility, it can be found in the following paragraph. Quote, to enable Congress to bribe the traitors and buy up the treason, the President gravely proposes an amendment to the Constitution which will require the approval of three-fourths of the states, giving that body the necessary authority, and the rebellion and slavery, the latter he admitted to be the sole cause of the former, till the introduction of the twentieth century, to be metamorphosed into loyalty and freedom. This is something more deplorable than lack of common sense. It closely borders on hopeless lunacy. It will assuredly excite the astonishment of all Europe, the derision of the southern traders, and the pity of every true friend of freedom. It would, in our judgment, warrant the impeachment of the President by Congress, as mentally incapable of holding the sacred trusts committed to his hands. End quote. That a man as constitutionally kind as Mr. Garrison could, in cold blood, 
or even in passion, write a statement like that about Lincoln, proves how bitterly disappointing, not to say discouraging, conditions were in this country during the last month of 1862. End of section 9「Section 10 of President Lincoln's Attitude Toward Slavery and Emancipation by Henry Watson Wilbur. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Final Proclamation As has been shown, there was much concern as to what President Lincoln would do in applying the Emancipation Proclamation as the 1st of January 1863 approached. There was no indication on the part of the border slave states that they would accept compensated emancipation. As the proclamation did not include these states in its provisions, there may have been no reason why they should, as no direct hint was given that it was the intent of the President to disturb the peculiar institution in states not in rebellion against the government. The great desire on the part of Mr. Lincoln that voluntary emancipation should be adopted by these states seems to have been due to a purpose on his part to as rapidly as possible entirely remove slavery from the country. It seems almost conclusive that after the policy of emancipation had been adopted by him, this larger desire was at the center of his purpose. The people did not have long to wait to find out the President's intention. Promptly, on the first day of January, the final proclamation appeared. It contained both clear-cut and qualifying clauses, and was as follows. Quote, Whereas, on the twenty-second day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States, containing, among other things, the following, to wit, Quote, that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will, on the first day of January aforesaid, by proclamation, designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof respectively, shall then be in rebellion against the United States, and the fact that any state, or the people thereof, shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. End quote. Now therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, by virtue of the power in me vested as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do, on this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and in accordance with my purpose so to do, publicly proclaim for the full period of one hundred days from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Plaquemine, Jefferson, St. John, 
St. Charles, St. James, Ascension, Assumption, Terbonne, La Fourche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia, and also the counties of Berkeley, Accomac, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are, for the present, left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And by virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are, and henceforward shall be, free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free, to abstain from all violence, unless in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare, and make known, that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind, and the gracious favor of Almighty God. In testimony whereof, I have hereunto set my name, and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington, this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and of the independence of the United States, the 87th. By the President, Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. End quote. President Lincoln's tenacity of purpose, having once put his hand to the plow, seems never to have wavered, notwithstanding the fact that the registered public opinion of the North apparently had not approved his original act. It will be noted that of the states in rebellion, Tennessee was not included in the proclamation. This was a concession made to Andrew Johnson, then military governor of that state. His feeling was that such exception might help in unionizing that commonwealth, in which there was a considerable loyal sentiment. The parts of states accepted from the provisions of the proclamation were believed to be in process of reconstruction, and what government they really possessed was administered, either directly or indirectly, by the military power of the United States. These exceptions were entirely in harmony with Mr. Lincoln's purpose not to violently disturb slavery only in such states or parts of states as were actually disputing the authority of the general government. As he always believed that his constitutional right to deal with slavery was purely as a necessity of war, he was careful at this time not to move against the institution where slaveholders were not opposing the authority of the United States. This proclamation had a more spectacular reception than the first draft issued in September. In several cities, military salutes were fired in honor. Governor Andrew of Massachusetts issued a special proclamation, ordering a salute of 100 guns, as representing the recognition by the Commonwealth of this important act. Meetings were held in churches and halls all over the North, but these demonstrations by no means indicated a unanimous approval of the President's action. It is, in fact, hardly safe to assume that a majority opinion was with Mr. Lincoln in January 1863, any more than it was in the preceding September. Two Kinds of Critics while the Friends of Freedom and the Union were rejoicing over the proclamation, the opposition, when not in sullen mood, sneered at the action of the President. 
and heaped upon him personal abuse as they hurled hatred at the cause which had won such an epoch-making document as the emancipation proclamation there seems to have been about the same alignment of pro-slavery opinion in the north as there was in september of course confederate opinion had if anything grown more intense jefferson davis sent a message to the confederate congress dated january twelfth eighteen sixty three it contained this paragraph among other statements as to how the states in rebellion against the government should meet mr lincoln's proclamation Quote, so far as regards the action of this government on such criminals as may attempt its execution i confine myself to informing you that i shall unless in your wisdom you deem some other course more expedient deliver to the several state authorities all commissioned officers of the united states that may hereafter be captured by our forces in any of the states embraced in the proclamation that they may be dealt with in accordance with the laws of those states providing for the punishment of criminals engaged in exciting servile insurrection end quote the upshot of the matter was that officers in the union army were to be considered criminals according to the antiquated and almost barbarous codes of dixie they were to be charged with inciting slaves to insurrection and dealt with accordingly that these drastic methods were not applied was due to the certainty of prompt and literal retaliation rather than to any nice notions about the amenities of so-called civilized warfare a great variety of captious critical opinion was uttered in the north probably earl russell england's foreign secretary expressed the views of a good many pro-slavery men and southern sympathizers in the north better and more ingeniously than they could do it themselves the letter was dated foreign office london january seventeenth eighteen sixty three and was addressed to lord lyons british minister to the united states referring to mr lincoln's proclamation earl russell among other things said quote, it professes to emancipate all slaves in places where the united states authorities cannot exercising jurisdiction now make emancipation a reality but it does not decree emancipation of slaves in any states or parts of states occupied by federal troops and subject to federal jurisdiction and where therefore emancipation if decreed might have been carried into effect there seems to be no declaration of principle adverse to slavery in this proclamation it is a measure of war and a measure of war of a very questionable kind as president lincoln has twice appealed to the judgment of mankind in his proclamation i venture to say that i do not think it can or ought to satisfy the friends of abolition who look for total and impartial freedom for the slave and not for vengeance on the slave owner End quote. earl russell like the pro-slavery critics of mr lincoln at home failed to recognize that the preliminary draft of the emancipation proclamation provided an easy way of emancipation with no vengeance in it while earl russell claimed to speak for abolitionists he was quite willing to join in the hue and cry against the one man in power who was providing any sort of abolition all critics of mr lincoln of this class either could not or did not want to understand his purpose not to exceed his constitutional prerogatives in dealing with slavery but even earl russell himself seems to have considered that english opinion in the main was more sympathetic with the cause of the union than was certain british official opinion the london morning star of january two eighteen sixty three made this statement quote, lord russell expressed to mr adams his belief that english sympathy as tested by popular meetings would still be found to be upon the side of the united states End quote. the star however thought the foreign secretary did not make his statement strong enough it declared that the overwhelming preponderance of sentiment was for the north 
the working men of england were very positive in placing their sympathy on the right side on the evening of december thirty one eighteen sixty two a large meeting of working men was held in london at which an address to president lincoln was adopted the meeting was held to signify support of the emancipation policy of mr lincoln in this address we find this statement quote, we have heard with indignation the slander that ascribes to england sympathy with a rebellion of slaveholders and all proposals to recognize in friendship a confederacy which boasts of slavery as its cornerstone we have watched with warmest interest the steady advance of your policy along the path of emancipation and on this eve of the day on which your proclamation of freedom takes effect we pray god to strengthen your heart to confirm your noble purpose and to hasten the restoration of that lawful authority which engages in peace or war by compensation or by force of arms to realize the glorious principle on which your constitution is founded the brotherhood freedom and equality of all men End quote. no stronger or more sympathetic words than these came to the sorely tried president during the four years of our national conflict similar meetings were held in many towns and cities in england on the same evening as the london meeting a great gathering was held in sheffield at which a series of resolutions was passed we quote the last one quote, that in the opinion of this meeting it is the duty of england as the recognized enemy of slavery to give her sympathy and support to the northern states to disapprove of the origin and continuance of the slave owners rebellion and by all peaceable means to try to cement a closer and stronger union between this country and the people and government of america End quote. as time went on certain advanced abolitionists in this country curbed the disposition to acknowledge any original emancipation purpose on the part of president lincoln on the last sunday evening of eighteen sixty two wendell phillips delivered a long discourse in masonic hall boston entirely made up of criticism of the president's recommendation regarding colonization exaggerating it into a main issue rather than an incident in mr lincoln's policy on the following sunday evening after the final proclamation mr phillips had that document for his subject he gave all the credit to the people and declared that the proclamation was quote, the reluctant gift of the leaders to the masses end quote. even then men of the phillips type had not yet caught the lincoln spirit in closing this chapter it may be a matter of interest to consider the full extent of emancipation as it was planned by president lincoln the anti-slavery standard made a calculation and a compilation showing the number of slaves included under the emancipation proclamation it made out a grand total of three million one hundred twenty three thousand three hundred forty nine as the number of slaves in the united states as reported by the census of eighteen sixty was three million nine hundred fifty three thousand eight hundred fifty seven it would seem that the proclamation left only eight hundred thirty thousand two hundred thirty eight outside of its provisions the pro-slavery element in evidence in march eighteen sixty three a law was passed by congress authorizing an enrollment of all men in the states subject to military duty three months later president lincoln in accordance with the provision of the statute ordered a draft so apportioned as to raise the three hundred thousand men for the union armies this draft was listed to begin in new york city on the thirteenth of july promptly on time the pro-slavery and anti-administration newspapers of the metropolis began to inflame the public mind and to do so in such a way as to inspire resistance to the law the result being the most disastrous and diabolical riot which ever disgraced an american city while resistance to the draft was pretendedly general and based on its claimed unconstitutionality
it was at heart traitorous and pro-slavery to the core as the riot progressed it vented its fury largely on inoffensive colored people and burned or damaged the property of prominent abolitionists and friends of the union it was one of the ugly reactions from the emancipation policy of the president showing plainly the strength and character of the opposition to the administration that opposition to the abolition war was the real spirit behind this riot is easy of demonstration on the morning before the draft began the new york journal of commerce said quote, some men say now that the war has commenced it must not be stopped until slavery is abolished such men are neither more nor less than murderers end quote. Riots of far less importance were simultaneously inaugurated in Boston, Jersey City, New Jersey, Troy, New York, and other places. The Union victory at Gettysburg and the fall of Vicksburg, however, had a discouraging effect upon the rioters, and the outbreaks rapidly subsided. That they were all demonstrations in aid of the Confederacy was pretty generally understood by Union men. If anything more was needed in confirmation, the exulting Confederate press voluntarily furnished the missing link. The Richmond, Virginia Inquirer of July 18, among other things, said, quote, Riot, murder, and conflagration have begun in New York. It is a wonder that this good work did not commence long ago, and this excellent outbreak may be the opening scene of the inevitable revolution which is to tear to pieces the most rotten society and leave the northern half of the old american union a desert of blood-soaked ashes we bid it good speed End quote. the richmond dispatch of the same date after predicting the absolute failure of the draft and declaring that quote, the days as well as the soldiers of the federal army are numbered End quote thus gleefully encouraged the contemplated confederate fire in the rear in the shape of rapine and murder at the hands of pro-slavery mobs in the north quote, let us have more of these outpourings a few more great cities on the mourners bench some more guttings and sackings of houses and hanging and mutilating of men it saves the confederate troops a deal of marching and lops off many a dreary month of this war. The sacking and burning has been heretofore at the South. Our compliments to our Northern brethren, and may they enjoy their turn. End quote. That the draft riots gave heart to the Confederacy needed no Southern witness to prove. Every anti administration newspaper in the North furnished ample evidence of that fact. These papers practically exhorted opposition to the authority of the government. Wherever mobs of this sort gathered and operated, they exhibited the Southern spirit as clearly as the two Richmond papers quoted above voiced it. At no point was this fact better illustrated than in the venom visited upon the colored people. The natural supposition would lead one to think that even a mob would have no cause against little children but the mob in new york respected neither age nor sex the colored orphan asylum was set on fire and destroyed the new york herald of july sixteenth said quote, the poor negroes or what is left of them are hourly leaving the city they claim that they are hardly allowed the privilege of escaping everywhere throughout the city they are driven about like sheep and numbers are killed of whom no account will ever be learned End quote. but it is not necessary to elaborate the revolting details enough has been given to illustrate the condition the evening post published in the metropolis in a headline aptly called the riot quote, the new york branch of the great rebellion End quote. this demonstration of insane and brutal fury in the nation's chief city helped to show how mistaken was that judgment which thought that nothing was necessary but emancipation to unite the North, and make the armies of the Republic continuously victorious. The draft itself 
proved that voluntary enlistments had not kept up the demand for recruits. End of section 10